Hello everyone. Good evening. A very warm welcome to yet another Indian Chess Society webinar on interstitial lung diseases. So this is our ILD series which has been going on which has been extremely successful. Uh, we are very very happy to bring today to you all a very very interesting topic which we keep on coming across but we don't end up discussing much in meetings. Today we'll be talking about NSIP, non-specific interstitial pneumonia and organizing pneumonia. The entire meeting is going to be about this. And we are just so happy and thrilled that we've got the best faculty from our country, the most distinguished and the most celebrated faculty from our country, who is going to be updating about these two very, very important topics. So a huge big thank you to Indian Chess Society, our president, Dr. Tandeep Salvi, and our secretary, Dr. Rajaghar, and the entire governing body of Indian Chess Society for taking this wonderful initiative to make sure that the best scientific knowledge is percolated all through it in our country to improve the quality of pulmonology that we are practicing. And I would really want to thank CIPLA for being our academic partners and helping us tremendously in this pur purpose. With this, I'd, I'd like to start the webinar. As always, the ILD series is first going to start with the talk on HRCT, chest, that you see in NSIP and OP. And we are so lucky that we have none other than Dr. Bhavin Shankarya, the most respected, the most celebrated, and the most brilliant radiologist of our country, who is going to be telling us everything that we need to know about the HRCD appearance in NSIP and OP. Dr. Bhavin Shankarya does not require any introduction at all. Despite that, I'd like to say that he is the best pulmonologist of our country, a very, very dear friend of mine. He owns picture this by Chankarya, which is a CT, MRI, PET scan. Everything that can be done in radiology offers that. Pandari radiology is his passion. He's got loads and loads of publications, hundreds of them. He's got so many books that he has actually written. And he's a wonderful writer who writes a beautiful column every Wednesday in our Mumbai Mirror. So with this brief introduction, I'd like to request Dr. Bhavin Chankarya to please start his talk. Imaging in NSIP and OP. Over to you, Bhavin. Thank you. Hi. Um, welcome to this talk on NSIP and OP. I'd like to thank um, CIPLA and ICS and specifically uh, Amita, Dr. Amita Nene, um, for asking me to speak on the subject. So today the plan will be to spend some time on NSIP, then OP, and then a little bit about mixed NSIP OP. NSIP is non specific interstitial pneumonia. OP is organizing pneumonia. And mixed is mixed. So here is, let's start off with a 49 year old patient who has scleroderma. We can see these reticular opacities in the non dependent upper lobes. Then we start seeing them in the dependent regions as well. You can see that in the mid and lower zones, there is temporal and spatial homogeneity, which means that in the same section, all the lesions appear to be of the same age. And as we go further down, we see some traction bronchiectasis. We see some subpleural sparing in the lung bases, but we do not see honeycombing. So this is classic nonspecific interstitial pneumonia where we have temporal and spatial homogeneity and we have subpleural sparing. To understand subpleural sparing, let's look at a patient with UIP, IPF, where the disease starts in the subpleural interstitium, whereas many patients with NSIP, not all. So subpleural sparing um, is a sign that helps us make a diagnosis of NSIP, but all patients with NSIP, and you'll see more cases going ahead, do not necessarily have subpleural sparing. But you see the subtle um, gray black, you know, between the abnormality and the pleura, and that is better appreciated on the sagittal images. Um, and you compare that to the sagittal appearance of the UIP IPF. Um, NSIP can be patchy, and as I said, you don't always have subpleural sparing. This is a patient with dermatomyositis and mild NSIP. But here is another patient with full-blown NSIP. You see subpleural sparing here, and again, this patient has um, uh, scleroderma. Very early disease is best appreciated when we have prone images where you can confirm 
that these subtle reticular opacities are, are really present and do not represent gravity-dependent densities, as in this 22-year-old with Raynaud's, and this is almost a 20-year-old scan uh, and was probably one of the first patients where we picked up this early disease. And then we had a patient recently where we, where the CT was done to see if there is interstitial lung disease. And you can see these very subtle reticular opacities confirmed that they are real on the prone images. And we also saw such saw subtle reticular opacities in the non-dependent upper lobes as well. So very, very early uh, NSIP. Now, we call it fibrotic NSIP when we see areas of traction bronchiectasis. If we see honeycombing, then we will call it a UIP pattern. And it could be an atypical UIP pattern or a variant pattern, which we may discuss in the future when we look at CTD ILD per se. But otherwise, if we see traction bronchiectasis, then we know for a fact that so this patient um, has progressive disease from 16 to 21 and you can see that this was fibrotic NSIP to begin with and has kept uh, progressing. So NSIP can be both fibrosing and non-fibrosing. Often it's a mixed pattern. It may precede full-blown connective tissue disease by a few years. And idiopathic NSIP is extremely rare. One question that as radiologists we kept getting asked is, can we differentiate reversible from non-reversible findings? And this is important from a prognostic and treatment perspective. So let's look at this, right? We have reticular opacities a little more superiorly in the right lower lobe. We have reticular opacities in the lung base. And the question will be, what will improve? What will worsen or what will remain the same? And I would assume that in all of these, there is a high possibility of improvement. And if you see four years later, all of these lesions have by and large regressed, including the lesions on the left side. So the ground glass has regressed, the reticular opacities have improved, and so everything was potentially reversible. But you know this only in hindsight, right? Now, here is a patient where you have a little bit of traction bronchiolectasis, but you also have a subtle areas of ground glass and reticular opacities, and you need to figure out what will improve and what will not. Well, guess what? All the lesions have progressed after a year, and I would have thought that some of this would improve, but it hasn't. And here we have another patient uh, in 23. Again, some traction bronchiolectasis, we would not expect these lesions to improve, but they have improved on treatment. So it is a little variable. Now, if there is frank traction bronchiectasis and architectural distortion, that's not going to improve. But in the early stages, a lot of this is potentially reversible. And we come back to that case um, of scleroderma ILD from 16 to 21, where there was absolutely no improvement at any stage. Another problem that we kept keep getting asked about is a patient like this, where we have reticular opacities, traction bronchiectasis, no honeycombing. Uh, we, it, let's ignore this nodule here. And then the question is, is this probable UIP or fibrotic NSIP? So if the patient is above 70, then we would call it UIP, IPF. If the patient is uh, under 50, we would say this is NSIP. Same appearance, it's the clinical presentation that matters. If the patient is a smoker, no known disease, it's more likely UIP, IPF, known connective tissue disease, patients on medications, etc., then it's more likely to be NSIP. But what if the patient is in the age group of 50 to 60, no connective tissue disease, non-smoker? What would you do next? And that is where we have a challenge because you would need to try and show that, you know, this is not UIP, IPF if we want a better prognosis for the patient. For example, this is a 57-year-old man. You have reticular opacities, you have a little traction bronchiectasis, there is some temporal and spatial homogeneity. We even thought there was a little bit of subpleural sparing. And so the question was, could this just be an NSIP? But probable UIP was a differential. The patient wanted to know a biopsy was done after MDD discussion. And this was categorical UIP um, and therefore IPF. And this patient actually succumbed within uh, five years. But it... it if this patient had any connective tissue disease, we would have just called it CTD-ILD with an NSIP pattern. So it's not always easy 
to differentiate one from the other and we should be cognizant of the clinical situation um and and read these images uh, in that context so if you have subpleural sparing spatial temporal homogeneity in a patient who looks like having either fibrotic nsip or probable uip then it's most likely nsip if you do not have subpleural sparing spatial temporal homogeneity then we look at the age under 50 likely to be nsip more than 70 likely probable uip the biggest challenge is in the 50 to 70 years age group if the patient is an ever smoker or has been a heavy smoker in the past then it's likely probable uip ipf if the patient has connective tissue disease or is on medications known to produce uh, nsip or medication induced pulmonary injury then that's likely that if the patient in this age group is a non smoker no connective tissue disease or drugs then you probably need a multidisciplinary uh, session and a biopsy so let's move on to organizing pneumonia it's an inflammatory process uh, within the small airways and alveoli with plugging of the distal uh, bronchioles it is an abnormal healing response to an insult if there is no etiology then we call it cryptogenic but very often we may find an underlying etiology there are multiple patterns predominant consolidation predominant ground glass perilobular mixed fibrotic reverse ground glass or presenting as a nodule or a mass so here is your bilateral subpleural basal consolidation here we have bilateral uh, again subpleural and peribronchovascular consolidation this is an op pattern but in a patient with covid here we have ground glass and consolidation mixed and a peribronchovascular distribution Here we again have a peribronchovascular distribution, but we see the reverse ground glass halo sign. So you've got ground glass in the center, consolidation at the periphery, representing an atoll. So that's why the atoll sign. Reverse bat swings again with ground glass in the center, consolidation at the periphery. But here you have a uh, bat swings, reverse bat swings, but purely consolidation. Both of these were eosinophilic pneumonias, but eosinophilic pneumonias are just one part of the spectrum. of an organizing pneumonia pattern now here we have peribronchovascular perilobular so this is again an op pattern in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis and here we have mass like areas but you can see air bronchogram so you know that this is a pneumonic uh, this is a consolidation and this pattern again bilateral basal is is suggestive of an op pattern now here we have these peribronchovascular areas of consolidation but you see traction bronchiectasis in a non acute setting then we would say this is a fibrosing organizing pneumonia patient in this patient with mixed connective tissue disease so when we see an op pattern there are really two things that we need to do both as radiologists and pulmonologists number one is is it truly op or is it one of the differentials and we look at that list now and if it is truly op is there an etiology or is it cryptogenic so the patterns have differentials the op pattern can also occur with lymphoma invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma vasculitis igg for disease sarcoid lipoid pneumonia so this patient has what looks like a classic op pattern but the clinical presentation was atypical so a pet and then a biopsy was done and this was a primary not primary this is lung lymphoma along with nodal uh, lymphoma again peribronchovascular opacities and this on biopsy turned out to be igg for disease uh, gpa can also present with an op like pattern this is not classic op so we from the beginning thought that this could be vasculitis and then when the anka was positive the patient was put on treatment and you can see here that in 15 days the lesions have significantly cleared again peribronchovascular areas of consolidation but you're also seeing these nodules at the periphery which doesn't occur with op and so that also this was a 9 month history of gradually progressive dyspnea so then it uh, tells us that we might be dealing with invasive mucinous adenocarcinoma and a biopsy proved this this is a patient known to have sarcoid has a reverse ground glass appearance so you can see the ground glass at the center and the periphery of consolidation but it's nodular so this nodular 
periphery or a nodular atoll sign is 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 something that occurs with granulomatous disease either sarcoid sometimes vasculitis or tuberculosis and this patient had lipoid pneumonia and we biopsied it so you realize here that a biopsy plays an important role in differentiating the mimics of an op pattern from op so even if there is the slightest of doubts and the clinical story doesn't match we should uh, immediately think of doing some form of biopsy whether it's bronchoscopy ebus guided whether it's cryo whether it's ct guided that doesn't matter also then we need to rule out common causes of an op pattern and that's the list here this patient um, had uti was a nitrofurantoin had this classic perilobular and peribronchovascular op pattern you see the peribronchovascular distribution here Uh, we figured out it was nitrofurantoin she stopped it and everything disappeared but the urologist restarted because there was some miscommunication and it kind of came back but then eventually again uh, when the nitrofurantoin was stopped the patient was fine this is amiodarone op very focal this is nivolumab op so you can see that you know these are etiology related uh, organizing pneumonia patterns this patient had sjogrens in uh, 2021 in jan and march and this was progressing with traction bronchiectasis so there was a strong fibrosing component uh, to the op pattern then we have the mixed nsip op pattern and this happens in connective tissue diseases where you can have differing morphologies at the same time and the reason we know that you can get mixed nsip op is from biopsies where some patients have had histology that has shown this and then when we see let's see we see subpleural sparing here with reticular opacities we're seeing there's an nsip pattern but you're also seeing a consolidation with air bronchograms telling us that there is a pneumonia so that's the organizing pneumonia in an indeterminate connective tissue disease or and and there is nsip so it's a mixed nsip op pattern or look at this anti synthetase syndrome patient subpleural sparing we know there's an nsip pattern but you see some of these peribronchovascular areas here suggest that there's a mixed op nsip or this patient with um uh, uh i think it's pmdm 40 year old again you have a combination of nsip and then proximally here you have an op like pattern so we do read these and report these as mixed uh, op nsip um in our reports as well so a uh, short topic today i finished in about 16 to 17 minutes the plan was to talk about nsip we've described its various appearances and how to look for subpleural sparing and temporans and spatial homogeneity and the typical questions we get asked you know reversible irreversible fibrotic nsip versus probable uip we've looked at op patterns we've looked at all the different forms we've looked at the mimics of op and then you know can we clinically figure out what the etiology is and lastly we've looked at the mixed nsip op situation again to remind you i have about 12 lectures for, these are all free available on this site that's my whatsapp channel i do put up regular posts on um, uh, ct chest related issues and you can subscribe to the channel and that's my non radiology book the kindle version is also now available on amazon for those of you who'd like to use it and that's my 2019 book on uh, ct of computer or ct of ild thank you so much for listening to me and have a great meeting take care bye bye uh thank you bhavin that was a fabulous talk you know what i really liked about the talk was that in addition to telling us what we see in hrct in op and nsip you kept on showing us cases which i think became extremely important and very very interesting and again in our discussion we're going to take up about very very specific findings that we see in each of these uh, two ilds so thank you bhavin as always you were just absolutely perfect after this Uh, I'd like to move to the second talk of our uh, today's webinar, which is going to be extremely interesting to all of us because it is actually going to tell us everything that we need to know 
about organizing pneumonia and about NSIP, you know, and we are just so lucky that we have none other than the best and the most ultimate Dr. B.P. Singh, who's going to be talking to us about everything that we need to know about NSIP and OP, the diagnosis, management and everything. So Dr. B.P. Singh requires no introduction whatsoever. He is the most dignified, the most brilliant, the most celebrated and the most fabulous pathologist of our country. He is the founder director and HOD uh, of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at Midland, Ho Midland uh, Hospital, Lucknow. And he's the president of Surya Foundation. He's been involved in medical research center, social welfare. He has been doing such fantastic work. He has been really a pioneer when it comes to interventional pulmonology in uh, Lucknow with 6,000 plus bronchoscopies, 1,800 plus thoracoscopies, 1,200 plus EBUSs, 100 cryobiopsies, 4,000 sleep studies, and so much, so much more. He has been the organizing secretary of the Respiratory Critical Care Update in Lucknow in 2016, 2012, 2015, 2018. He's conducted so many national, international pulmonary conferences. He's received various awards, Health Icon Award, from Times of India, Shriji Foundation Award 2016-17, Trivedi Foundation Honours as Exemplary Selfless Contribution. I think if I talk about Dr. B.P. Singh, I'll keep on talking till tomorrow morning and I'll still have so much more to say. But most important, he's a wonderful person, a great human being and a very, very dear friend of mine. Over to you, Dr. B.P. Singh. We are really looking forward to listening to you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nene, for giving such a kind introduction. I'm really humbled and first I would like to share my presentation actually, just a minute. Uh, the topic assigned to me by Dr. Nene and Indian Chess Society is the non-specific interstitial pneumonia and organizing pneumonia. Dr. Bhavin Jankar has already discussed about the radiological uh, issues, especially the CT diagnosis which is very important in confirming the disease. As uh, Dr. Nene has mentioned that he spoke so well about the de details of the subject that um, we are clear how it looks like in the CT. While we are just looking at a non-specific interstitial pneumonia and organizing pneumonia, we know that the interstitial lung disease, most of the time we have been talking about just about the IPF. And also, this part of the uh, uh, ILD, we have not been discussing so often. Probably that is the reason she has allotted this topic to me and we'll be discussing few points about this very specific disease occurring very frequently, not so uncommon and that has got a very important clinical relevance. NSIP or non-specific interstitial pneumonia was first defined as one of the different group of pulmonary fibrosis by Kazenstein and Fireleary in 1994. The both have reported in 1994 the pathological features of new interstitial pneumonia named non-specific interstitial pneumonia or fibrosis. The histological whole mark is varying proportions of interstitial inflammation and fibrosis that appear to be occurring over a single time span. The process, it is temporarily uniform. As Bhavan has already mentioned in his presentation that it is a homogeneous form of the disease. It may have varying etiologies including underlying connective tissue disease which is very important and organic dust or other exposures and prior acute lung injury less often it may reflect a non-representative biopsy of another process you might be seeing a pre predominant a different pathology while you might be getting the biopsy the nsip as a finding the histopathologic features of nsip are seen in connective tissue disease related ild disease and hypersensitive immunities also at times in 2008 and the eight years, report recommended that clinicians recognize idiopathic non-specific interstitial pneumonia as a distinct rather than a provisional clinical entity. So it was framed as NSIP by the eight years in 2008, not a very old disease as per se to identify. NSIP is chronic interstitial pneumonia with the homogeneous appearance of interstitial fibrosis and inflammation. So there are homogeneous appearance of interstitial fibrosis and inflammation. There are two cardinal features. It is non-specific as it lacks the histopathological features of the other subtypes of the interstitial uh, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. NSIP typically has bilateral lung involvement and may have a predisposition for the lower lobes. 
in it constitutes 14 to 36 percent of the cases of idiopathic interstitial pneumonia which is less common than usual interstitial pneumonia 50 to 60 percent but more common than dip and rbild 10 to 70 percent and acute interstitial pneumonia which is 0 to 2 percent idiopathic nsip occurs mostly in middle-aged women who are non-smokers while nsip due to connective tissue disease is equal in men and women you all know Underlying disease association are very important in the non-specific interstitial pneumonia. Non-idiopathic NSIP is associated with a number of underlying causes. The most prevalent form of the ILD to complicate connective tissue disease. And it is frequently the histological pattern seen when ILD complicates polymyositis and dermatomyositis. It is very important. The Sjogren syndrome, the systemic sclerosis and interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. NSIP is seen in rheumatoid arthritis though far less commonly than the UIP pattern, which is much more common in the rheumatoid arthritis-induced interstitial lung disease. So to list a few, which, what are the common uh, things which are associated with NSIP? So CTD is uh, predominance is high, idiopathic NSIP is moderate, and H HP is moderate association. However, the drug-induced viral infection, radiation-induced NSIP has low predominance. Granulomatous polyangiitis, sarcoidosis, and rheumatoid arthritis have a rare uh, connection with NSIP. If you look at the pathological type, the Dr. Bhavanin's presentation already mentioned, the, there are three types of NSIP which has been explained, uh, rather uh, presented. The cellular NSIP is dominated by the active inflammation. The fibrotic NSIP dominated by the stabilized fibrosis. And mixed NSIP demonstrating combination of inflammation and fibrosis. They all have their prognostic significance. If you look at the cellular NSIP, there is a widespread thickening of the LV receptor by the cellular infiltrate. On the high power resolution, the septal widening is due to mild to moderate infiltrate of lymphocytes with scattered plasma cells with minimal associated fibrosis. In the fibrotic NSIP, it is there is a basically the, there is a NSIP pattern where the interstitial fibrosis uniformly involves the lobule. And on high power, the alveolar septa is thickened by dense collagen fibrosis. In place of the cellular element, it is the collagen fibrosis with the scattered chronic inflammatory cells. That is the fibrotic NSIP. NSIP infiltrates usually include a mixture of lymphocytes and plasma cells within the alveolar septum, prominently found in the peribronchial interstitium. As Dr. Bhavin in his presentation mentioned, up to 79% of the cases may demonstrate organizing pneumonia, although the OP features generally do not predominate when the NSIP is the predominant finding. And the finding of the prominent OP suggests the presence of CTD associated ILD much more often. Overlapping histopathological features of HP, the presence of loosely formed granulomas may be detected, and it should prompt the investigator to prompt have prompt investigation for an antigen. <laughs> How it clinically presents? The idiopathic NSIP most commonly affects the non-smoking middle-aged adults between 40 and 60 years of age with the female prediction. Like most other IIPs, NSIP tends to be pre present with a subacute onset of dyspnea and cough. Lung examination frequently but not universally reveals bilateral crackles. An extra pulmonary examination may provide clues to an underlying CTD, which is very important. You have to look to your patient for the extra pulmonary site of involvement. For the, as if for the extra pulmonary site, the presence of heliotropic uh, rash around the eyes, shawl-like rash around the neck, and digital edema, these formation, with the like the mechanics hand, suggests the underlying dermatomyositis. The presence of telangiectasia, calcinosis, and sclerodactyly suggests a diagnosis of scleroderma. The presence of joint effusions and radial deviation of the MCP joint suggests an underlying diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. Ocular and or salivary gland dryness associated with Sjogren's syndrome and Raynaud phenomena and swallowing difficulties characteristic of the systemic sclerosis may be found in the patients of the NSIB. So how you are going to investigate this patient? <clears throat> First thing is most important, the clinical evaluation has to be done in detail. Detailed history and physical examination is very important. Patients should be asked about exposure to airborne antigens, medication list, history of exposure to radiation, HIV risk factors, CTD symptoms as well as the family history. So all this has to be looked very carefully. In the blood investigation, you have to look for the 
basically the autoimmune profile uh, in detail and mix uh, rather than matching it with the clinical symptoms. And the, like here, I have mentioned that anti nuclear antibody, rheumatoid factor, anti CCP, anti Sogren syndrome A and B antibody, anti SM antibody, anti SCL 70, and anti ARS, the ZO and uh, CYL. <clears throat> so all these antibodies. You, there are panel available which you can go directly and ask your pathologist to get these tests done so that you can evaluate your patient for the connective tissue disease. Antibodies test for HP, a uh, hypersensitive pneumonitis, which is usually negative in the idiopathic NSIP. And all these uh, antigens you know that avian antigens, the pigeon, the parakeet, the bajarigar, uh, and chicken. The fungus like trichosporin aspergillosis has been important one. Bacteria, the actinomyces has been very important for the HP and mycobacteria like mycobacterium avium intracellular and chemicals. Increased serum KL6, <coughs> Krebs Monlangen 6, this uh, basically the uh, enzyme has shown to be increased in the patients of the interstitial lung disease and normal value is less than 500. It is much more relevant for the acute exacerbation where the higher levels are associated with the poor prognosis. <coughs> The pulmonary function test is very important and it shows there is a restrictive pattern in the patient with the NSIP and also there is a decrease in the diffusion. So a 6 minute walk test to just for, is there to check for the hypoxia at rest or the existential hypoxia is there. So this is also a very important test and a very simple test to perform in the patient with the NSIP. <coughs> Monitored force vital capacity. And DLC is helpful to monitor for progression and correlate with the clinical symptoms as well as to monitor response to treatment and offer additional information on prognosis. Patients with NSIP typically have a spirometry restrictive pattern on the PFTs with reduced TLC and DLC. <coughs> Just X-ray may show increased basilar markings and or interstitial pro prominence bilaterally and it may be normal also. I will not go into the detail of the HRCT as already mentioned by Dr. Pavin, but you all know that distribution tip is typically peripheral and lower lobe predominant, but may also involve upper lobe without any obvious apico-basal gradient at time. Disease may be patchy or peribronchovascular in distribution. And one very important finding, there is subpleural sparing in many of the patients. When the tissue biopsy is required for the diagnosis of an SIP, VATS is the procedure of choice. However, the TBLB, even the cryolung biopsy, or may not be uh, giving you the full diagnosis in all of the patients. So probably it is the VATS, uh, uh, is the procedure of choice for taking the tissue biopsy in the patient with NSIP. Although you can do TBLB and bronchoscopic lavage in the patient just to rule out other diseases. <coughs> How you are going to treat them? There are two especially uh, uh, treatment, the pharmacological treatment and the support. In the pharmacological treatment, the immunosuppressants and the antifibrotics are the mainstay of the therapy. In the supportive, you all know the vac oxygen, the vaccination, the rehabilitation. And it depends on cause, severity of the disease, and presence or the degree of fibrosis and the rate of the disease progression. Immunosuppression in NSIP is predominantly studied in patients with the concomitant CTD ILD. Now coming to the drugs, <coughs> is especially steroid, there is no clear gu guideline for the dose and duration of steroid but it is recommended for 0.5 to 1 mg per kg or 40 to 60 mg prednisolone can be used as the initial dose. And it can be continued for 4 weeks and depending upon the response, you can taper down slowly in 6 to 12 months. Pulse steroids for rapidly progressive fulminant disease can be given IV with doses of 750 to 1000 mg per day for 3 days followed by the tapering doses as already mentioned. To add a steroid sparing agent to transition the patient completely of steroids at least to the lowest part dose possible, you may add the immuno, other immunosuppressant <laughs> like azathioprine in the dose of 1.5 to 2 mg per kg per day, maximum 200 mg per day, and mycophenolate morphotel, which inhibits the B and T cell function through the inhibition of the purine synthesis. And the target dose is 2 to 3 g per day, uh, maximum for the therapy. Other immunosuppressants have also been tried like cyclophosphamide, rituximab, tacrolimus and tocilizumab and 
Antifibrotics can be considered in patients with progressive fibrotic ILD. You all know that uh, basically the inbuilt trial has shown very clearly that use of nintinanib has shown the drop in the FVC is significantly reduced by 50% in the patient with the fibrotic ILD. So in that way, you can use it. However, data for the perfendone has not been very uh, strong, but many of the studies have shown that it is all equally effective in the fibrotic ILD also. So, in the supportive management, already I have mentioned, I will not go into the detail. <clears throat> it is the oxygen therapy, treat the concomitant disease like reflux esophagitis or pulmonary hypertension. Symptomatic therapy for dyspnea or cuff can be performed. Pulmonary rehab is very important and most of the time it is missed, but it should be incorporated in the treatment management very effectively. And in the last, evaluate your patient for the lung transplant if the disease is advancing in spite of all these measures of management. Coming to the organizing pneumonia is a specific pulmonary reaction to a diverse range of pneumotoxic agents, both internal and external, which produce a radiologically and histologically characteristic type of inflammatory lesion that causes the distal airways to fill with an organizing fibrous exudate and inflammatory cells in the absence of disrupted lung architecture. So there is a material filled in the alveoli and in the distal airways. OB is regarded as a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia when the causating factor has not been identified as secondary organizing pneumonia when the possible cause of the disease is known. It is basically epidemiology is poorly documented. One, in one of the studies they have mentioned 1.97 to 7 per lakh case of the OP is reported. The incidence of COP, the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, has been decreasing in the recent years because of the improvements in the diagnosis of the causative factors. So most of the time, it is secondary organizing pneumonia. Approximately 3% of patients with ILD are presumed to have diagnosis of organizing pneumonia. And this is the histological picture as it looked to be. There is basically polypoidal intramuscular intra luminal collection of the loose connective tissue that protrude in the distal airway. The adjacent lung parenchyma is relatively normal in the picture of A. In the picture B, you can see here the <clears throat> basically these are the polypoid plugs seen within the alveolar spaces and alveolar ducts and which is identified with this basically uh, thick arrows but bronchiolar involvement is minimal <coughs> here this one and alveolar architecture is preserved in this uh, patient of the organizing pneumonia in case of focal organizing pneumonia there's distinct entity there's a nodular lesion consisting of the organizing pneumonia pattern as seen in a and b surrounded by the relatively normal lung architecture the leaves and in the picture d the lesion consists of polypoid plugs of loose connective tissue within the distal air spaces. So there is a basically the collection of the furnace material which is there and that fills the alveoli and also the respiratory uh, bronchiole. Mm -hmm. This is the differentiation between the two uh, uh, NSIP and the organi cryptozoic organizing pneumonia. I will not, I will just skip it <coughs> for the sake of time I was already mentioned and the uh, NS features of the NSIP and the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Few things which are important. The lung architecture is preservation uh, is there in the NSIP. However, it is predominantly preserved in the OP also, but presence of organizing pneumonia within the bronchioles can lead to bronchiolar obstruction and distortion, contributing to further architectural changes in many a time. In NSIP, there is a temporal homogeneity. While in the COP, it may exhibit temporal heterogeneity with area of the organizing pneumonia interspersed with the normal lung parenchyma. This is the basic difference. <coughs> in the clinical features of the OP, it presents like basically features of the community acquired pneumonia or a flu like illness with symptom onset usually less than two months prior to diagnosis. The most common presenting symptom in the majority of patients is a persistent, non productive cough that is variably accompanied by features uh, of fever. Fatigue, malaise, weight loss, and or dyspnea on exertion in half to two thirds of the patient. So, patient might present like pneumonia. May and cough may present in small subset of patients rapidly progressive disorder that leads to acute respiratory failure that can meet criteria for acute respiratory distress syndrome. And usually, outcome is poor in these subgroup of patients. 
Physical exhaustion of chest reduces inspiratory cackles in most patients, and wheezing is usually not present. Chest auscultation may not reveal any abnormal breath sounds in some patients, and digital clubbing is rarely seen. What are the important investigations? Basically, uh, the routine investigation will not give you much thing, uh, uh, much information, but C-reacting protein and the ESR are usually high. There are bilateral diffuse alveolar opacity with preserved lung volumes are the classical patterns seen on the chest radiograph and HRCT imaging in patients with cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, as mentioned by Dr. Bhavin Jankari in his presentation. PFT is usually abnormal and shows a restrictive pattern. Airflow obstruction is uncommon and usually found only in current or former smokers. And gas exchange abnormality in the presence of the decreased DLCO is there. The, what is the treatment? Spontaneous improvement is noticed in the mild form of organizing pneumonia in less than 10% of the patient. Systemic glucocorticosteroid therapy is the preferred treatment for the symptomatic patient. The starting dose is 0.5 to 1 mg per day slow per kg per day for the ideal body weight, maximum 60 mg per day for two to four weeks and gradually you taper it down in six to twelve months. Pulse therapy for patients with severe disease and one very important development in last couple of decades has been there. The macrolide therapy in the form of the clarithromycin for 500 mg BD for three months as recommended as a sole treatment and it has basically proven to be very effective and especially those patients who are not very uh, severely sick or having uh, rather uh, respiratory insufficiency is not there in the group of patients, it is effective. Cytotoxic therapy with azathioprine or cyclophosphine has not been recommended in patients with cough. MMF has been used as a corticosteroid sparing agent. Cyclosporine, rituximab and IVIG has been used in combination with steroid but with limited success to treat rapidly progressive disease unresponsive to the glucocorticosteroid. So, to summarize, <coughs> The NSIP is an interstitial lung disease that may be idiopathic or secondary to connective tissue disease, toxins, or numerous other causes. Disease has a female predominance, and more than 50% patients have never responded. Eval an evaluation of the underlying pathology is necessary for a firm diagnosis. Organizing pneumonia is associated with a variety of diseases such as infections and systemic diseases. It is a diagnosis by exclusion made by the multidisciplinary care team. MDD is required for, to form a confident diagnosis for, for tissue biopsy in select patient and VATS is the procedure of choice. In organizing pneumonia, the survival is very good in the e and also in the NSIP, the 5 to 10 year survival of 80% and 73% in the NSI, idiopathic NSIP with cellular NSIP must having much more favorable uh, event-free survival compared to the fibrotic one. A spontaneous remission in less than 10% patient of the OP and patient demonstrated rapid symptomatic response to treatment up to 80% achieve complete cure in the patient of the organizing pneumonia. Detailed history and meticulous evaluation along with periodic follow-up is pertinent for the optimum management of these patients. So with these words, I'd like to thank all of you for the patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. B.P. Singh for this fantastic state-of-the-art talk. You have covered everything about NSIP and OP that we need to know, whether be it etiology, clinical features, pathology, diagnosis, and management. Mm -hmm. And the best time, best thing is that you've told us in this limited period of 20 minutes, which we gave you. So thank you so much for giving this fabulous information and also for sticking to time. I think it was really a state-of-the-art talk. Thank you once again. Now I'd like to start with our panel discussion. And we are really blessed to have the most distinguished panel uh, and the faculty, as I said earlier, we are very, very lucky. We've got some of the best doctors today, the best pathologists today who are going to be on board. So I'd like to first introduce our senior most uh, panelist, Dr. K.S. Satish. Of course, we all know Dr. Satish so very well. He is somebody who absolutely requires no introduction at all, but I shall still complete the formalities. He's your, he's got 41 plus years of experience. I really don't know if to believe it because he looks so young. I would basically ask him if he's also 41 years of age. And to say that he's completed 41 years in practice is amazing. So I think it's wonderful to be a fantastic physician. And it's even better to look so good even now. So hats off to you, Dr. Satish. We are seriously impressed. And in addition to teaching us pathology, you also have to teach us how to look so good always. 
He is the senior pulmonologist at Manipal Miller's Road Hospital. He is the president of Karnataka Pulmonologist Association. And I must say that he has been the president of the KPA forever. And nobody is ready to let him resign or let him step down. For so many years, he's been requesting everybody to take over. But he's just such a perfect and such an efficient president and so very popular that nobody's allowing to just give up. And I think that's really sweet. He's a fellow of British Thoracic Society. He's a member of ICS. And most importantly, he is a very, very dear, dear friend of mine who I will even call up in the middle of the night to chat if I want to because he's just absolutely wonderful. After Dr. Satish. Hi, Dr. Satish. Hi, hi. I'm welcome to you. Well, yes. thank you. Thank you so much, Amita. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. After Dr. Satish, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Prajay Lunia. So uh, before I talk about Prajay, first, uh, I just want to say that extremely efficient, extremely brilliant, and a fabulous pulmonologist from Mumbai, who we all are just so very proud of. He is fantastic in his knowledge, and he's so very good in his practice. I mean, we are so very proud to be knowing him. He's affiliated with uh, Holy Spirit. He's a consultant with Holy Spirit Hospital, with the Bharatiya Aragniti Hospital, with the Kritikya Hospital in Mumbai. He has uh, he's an ex-clinical assistant at Hinduja Hospital, critical care department. He has worked with us before. He's been ex-clinical assistant at Bombay Hospital, somebody who we completely relied on. If Rajai saw the patient and told us something, we were very happy skipping that patient because we knew he would have seen it as, as well or even better than us. Most importantly, I want to say that he has done his PG from Nair Hospital, the same hospital that I did my PG from. We have the same alma mater, we have our same mentor. And I feel so very proud that I share the same uh, teacher and mentor and alma mater as Prajay. Prajay had also been the first runner-up at the National TYSA. He got the travel grant from ERS, uh, from ICS for the best uh, paper. Best Oral Paper Presentation Award, NAPCON 2016, and areas of interest are airway diseases and ILD. So, Prajay, a warm welcome to you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, ma'am. And uh, being your junior, everybody would know, like, I might be one person of your knowledge, probably, and I'm very thankful to you as well as JMD, madam, for that. No, thank you so much. You know, I mean, taking my name and madam's name in the same breath is the best compliment I can get. Thank you so much. After this, I'd like to introduce a very, very... A uh, brilliant and a beautiful female pulmonologist, my very, very dear friend, Dr. Amina Mubashir, who looks extremely young, but she is extremely knowledgeable, extremely intelligent, and she does fantastic work. Somebody who I'm very, very proud of, and I'd love to be associated with her. She's a consultant at the Max Saket New Delhi Hospital. She's had so many presentations, so many publications. Uh, uh, she has uh, basically done her IDCCM and she has just so many degrees in addition to her DNB. She has done the EDRM also. Her areas of interest are critical care, allergy, immunology. Uh, she received the Dr. S. N. Gore Young Scientist Award at NAPCON 2018. She also received the Best Paper Award at NAPCON 2018. Very, very enterprising, a wonderful interventional pulmonologist she doesn't talk much she lets the work talk but i would say she's one of the ladies who's doing maximum work of ip in a country with a very sweet smile and low profile uh, who does fantastic pulmonology and is also very very pleasant and smiling all the time so warm welcome dear amina thank you so much for being on board thank you so much ma'am those words are very humbling thank you so much uh, great and now Last but not the least, we have Dr. Samir Bansal, again, a very young, dynamic, enterprising pulmonologist who we all are just so very proud of. He basically is a consultant at uh, uh, Apollo Hospital, Bangalore. He's also consultant and clinical head, Vayu Chest and Sleep speciali uh, Specialities. We know Vayu is standalone pulmonology institute, which is doing everything that you may want in pulmonology under one roof in Bangalore. It's state-of-the-art unit, which uh, Dr. Samir Vansal is the clinical head and consultant at, 
closely associated with and it makes us very very proud to know that our Samir is doing such fantastic work more than 35 publications in book chapters in national and international journals looks very young but has been working so very hard most importantly uh, Apollo Hospital under uh, the leadership of Dr. Samir Vansal, Dr. Ravi Mehta and Dr. Hari Prasad are now starting mm. the most coveted IIB IP fellowship and we are very very proud to be associated with them again I have a soft corner for Samir, just like I have a soft corner for Prajay, because Samir also, like Prajay and me, belongs to Nair Hospital where we did our PG. So same alma meter. So we feel we have the same umbilical cord and we all think same, we all behave same and we all like to walk together. So fantastic, young, dynamic Samir Bansal, a warm welcome to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, thanks for the opportunity, especially, you know, sharing this whole platform with all of you and you know dr bp saying yourself dr satish and all the other colleagues thank you so much for this you know thank you so very much you know in fact we always make it a point that we have the best faculty always in our webinars but i feel probably today is a very special day where in particular we have had the bestest faculty till date and i'd like to tell everybody that we already have 1682 logins 1682 people are listening to us and they're logged in so that's great. Thanks to our wonderful faculty. Um, okay. May I uh, now have the absolute honor of introducing Dr. Amita Nene, who actually needs no introduction at all for uh, anyone. She is the head department of respiratory medicine at Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. She is the program in charge and teacher, DNB respiratory medicine, a legendary person, an absolutely amazing person. She is always there for everyone in whichever way you need her. And apart from that, of course, she is the leading Indian woman pulmonologist. No one has any doubts in saying that. I, for one, uh, truly believe that she's author of more than 50 publications and 12 chapters in pulmonary textbooks. She's the honorary secretary of Indian Association for Bronchology, member of board for Regents for WOBIP, West Zone Chairperson of Thoracic Endoscopic Society of India, governing body member of the Indian Chess Society and the recipient of Young Achiever Award in the field of pulmonology. And the list goes on and on. We can literally spend the night here trying to, you know, do justice to what this woman has achieved in so little time. Ma'am, we are all so proud of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Amina, for this lovely introduction. So now let's just start cracking our panel because we already have so many questions which are awaiting us from the audience. Uh, so first, I'd like to come to the big boss, Dr. Satish. So, so let's start with the basics. So I want to basically first just understand uh, two, three questions for you in one question. So what is NSIP? How common is NSIP in the world of ILD? What is idiopathic NSIP and how common is it? Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity, Amita. Uh, when you called, I couldn't say no to you. And uh, everyone uh, else also have the same feeling. And uh, what a uh, gathering it's been now. And uh, two brilliant talks. And to take it forward now uh, is about you know, mainly recapitulating what has been done uh, in the last few minutes. So NSIP is, as the name suggests, is uh, non-specific interstitial pneumonia. And uh, the hallmark of this uh, non-specific interstitial pneumonia is that it lacks the, char the characteristics which are so pathognomonic of uh, histological findings of acute interstitial pneumonia usual interstitial pneumonia, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, or chronic HP. So it doesn't have, it simply means nonspecific interstitial pneumonia doesn't have the characteristics of the other forms of interstitial pneumonia. And of course, there are um, histological features, which we will talk to you, uh, which has been spoken, and then we'll discuss with that later. Now, what is the incidence? It's not so common, but also, uh, you know, even though it's rare, but it's been reported, uh, as Dr. Singh mentioned, close to 14% to 36% in the world literature. I was trying to dig out, uh, Amita, about our own uh, Indian registry, uh, which mentions something like 8% to 8.5% of uh, the 
uh, interstitial lung disease consists of uh, non-specific interstitial pneumonia, and that. Uh, and the reporting also sometimes can be biased, can uh, have various uh, variables uh, where the definition and the uh, biopsies and so on and so forth uh, may not be there to include it as non-specific interstitial uh, pneumonia. So the other question that you, I think you asked oh, about, yes. about how, uh, how uh, common. You, uh, what is idiopathic NSAP and how common is it? Okay. So uh, when we talk about uh, uh, non-specific interstitial pneumonia, the idiopathic variety is where there is no definite etiology after trying to uh, find out the, uh, the cause for uh, the non-specific interstitial pneumonia. And it means that there are other uh, causes of non-specific interstitial pneumonia. For example, connective tissue uh, disease uh, related non-specific interstitial pneumonia has been uh, dealt in detail or mentioned detail by Dr. Singh, for example, scleroderma, uh, SLE, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, polymyositis, and so on. So that's connective tissue disease ILD of nonspecific uh, interstitial pneumonia. And there are drug induced uh, causes of nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. I think Bowen mentioned uh, one of the few drugs especially mentioning about and uh, demonstration of, uh, of a nitrofurantine induced. I had recently also last week one nitrofurantine induced patient been oh. using for more than nine years. So, Dr. Uh, Satish, instead of telling us the causes, can you tell us what is idiopathic and how yeah. common it is? Because so, when, yeah. 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 Amita, yeah. So when you rule out all this, you are left with uh, the idiopathic variety where there is no definite etiology and uh, patient has all the classical features of non-specific interstitial. I think that Singh mentioned about the symptoms. That is, uh, you know, a, a type of exclusion. I would say for uh, diagnosing as idiopathic non-specific interstitial. Yeah, great. So uh, wonderful, Sabi. I really like you also gave Indian data, Dr. Satish. That is just so you, always perfect in everything that you say. So we just need to understand that NSIP is very, very common and it is not something that we just ignore. We have to learn how to identify NSIP on HRCT because we may not be blessed to have Bhavin with us always. So NSIP is in the world literature 14 to 36%, but as per our ILD registry, it's about 8%. Even we have the Chandigarh registry there also, it is about 8%. So NSIP is really there. And uh, when we don't find any other cause, then it's idiopathic NSIP. But I would like to say that idiopathic NSIP is extremely rare. So if you find, if you want to call your NSIP idiopathic, then please keep on looking for history and more history and more history because idiopathic NSIP is truly rare. And actually, I have really not come across any idiopathic NSIP. And very often we call it NSIP and three, four years later, the patient presents with CTD. So just keep on hunting for a cause. So, great. After this, I'd like to come to Prajay. So, Dr. Prajay, please tell us that uh, while Dr. Satish was so nicely enumerating, I actually made him stop. So, you tell us which are the conditions which are associated with NSIP. So, uh, NSIP, the most common condition which is associated is the connective tissue disease, as Jankarya said, as well as Satish has said. So, in that, you have uh, uh, systemic lupus, erythematosus, rheumatoid arthritis, Jogren syndrome, and many other connective tissue diseases. Other than that, you can have certain drugs related uh, NSIPs and certain immunocompromised conditions also causes NSIPs. So these are the most common reasons for your NSIP. <laughs> Sometimes chemotherapy drugs induced NSIP also occurs. So when, <clears throat> sorry, when all other causes have been ruled out, then it is called as idiopathic, which is very rare. So if you're getting an NSIP pattern, you should always try to find out the cause. Especially you should do a psychology <laughs> test, even if you're not getting any features of connective tissue disease. Because sometimes you might have a CTD flavored ILD. That is person having a features of an ILD and with serology positive and person has not developed any clinical features suggestive of a connective tissue disease. Wonderful. So basically, as uh, Dr. Satish and Dr. Prajay said, whenever there's NSIP, look for an etiology. 
CTD most common. Usually as a rule, we always ask for an ANA blot. And please note if the ANA blot comes negative, please go ahead with the myositis panel because now we also have myositis panel which is available. And sometimes we're getting NSIP as a part of myositis. So this is something that we have to do. Drug history, very, very important. Nitrofurantoin, any kind of chemotherapeutic drugs, amiodarone, methotrexate also. All these are known to cause NSIP. Immunological, uh, immunocompromising conditions, most important HIV, because HIV related NSIP is a well known entity. And therefore, if you don't find any other conditions, please look for, um, uh, check the HIV status, because if the CD4 count is less than 200, then HIV itself gives rise to NSIP. And sometimes, you know, even radiation, injure, radiation injury to the lungs on biopsy might just show an NSIP pattern. So, uh, thank you, Prajay, for the detailed answer. Great. Now I'd like to come to uh, Dr. Amina. So, Dr. Amina, can you please tell us what is the demographic profile and clinical features of patients of NSIP? How would they present? Right. So, uh, if we talk about the demography of uh, NSIP, so if we speak about idiopathic NSIP with no associated cause, it is most common in middle-aged people. The uh, NSIP, which is related to connective tissue disorders, there's been seen that it has an equal male to female occurrence. Uh, if we see the Indian ILD registry, uh, it was found that the idiopathic NSIP uh, patients had a mean age of around 55, again, middle-aged uh, persons, and the males were 46%. If we get into the ethnicity bit of it, there is not much of Indian data here. However, in a recent paper published in CHEST uh, 2023, NSIP is the most common pathological pattern in both black and white races. However, in the black population, CTD is most common clinical diagnosis. As opposed to white population and Hispanics where HP is the most common clinical diagnosis. So that is the demographic features. If we speak of the clinical presentation, of course, the patient uh, would present with the uh, history of uh, cough, breathlessness, uh, 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 drop in saturation. Uh, the patients uh, associate with an associated uh, connective tissue disease would have uh, features related to those uh, connective tissue disease like uh, Reynolds phenomena or difficulty in swallowing or uh, uh, rash, uh, depending on what kind of connective tissue disease that we're dealing with. Okay, great. So that was great. Thank you so much. So uh, like Dr. Amina said, if it's NSIP idiopathic, then more common in women. But if it is associated, then it may be seen in uh, uh, same uh, percentage in both the sexes. And uh, I'm quite happy that she also included the Indian ILD registry data. So that's wonderful. Now I'd like to come to Samir. So Dr. Samir, please tell us that, you know, we have heard from everybody that whenever you get NSIP, you have to check if there's anything else present. So when you're uh, seeing a patient who's having suspected NSIP, in addition to taking respiratory history, what specific questions would you ask this patient? So I think uh, this point cannot be stressed more. I think all of our speakers and, you know, panelists, everyone has suggested that, yes, idiopathic NSIP is an entity which is highly debatable. And in fact, the recent data also suggests, in fact, there was a 2021 paper by Dr. Parr on NSIPs and all, in which they say almost 90, 94% of all NSIPs are actually related to some or the other cause. So that trick is to find that particular cause because idiopathic NSIP, if not now, maybe down the lane will turn into some, you know, secondary to some other cause. So the question is that, yes, we all say connective tissue disorder is one of the most common entities which can lead to NSIP pattern. So do you have a screening questionnaire of sorts or can you use something in your clinical practice? Yes, absolutely. One of the major things is, yes, if you can ask the patient any history of arthralgia, which may affect anything, small joints, large joints or something like that, and which at some point of time may or may not have been evaluated. So always make it a point to ask for, say, stiffness of the muscle, stiffness of your back, you know, especially early morning stiffness. Or maybe if you have to turn all the way, you cannot turn beyond a certain degree. If you have any stiffness swelling of your small joints, especially the wrist joint, the finger joints, and similarly, so on and so forth. Apart from that, any particular rashes, muscle weakness. Now, muscle weakness, most of the times what we've seen, you ask the patient, patient will say, no, I don't have any muscle weakness. So you ask specific questions, leading questions. For example, you know, just for proximal muscle weakness, do you face difficulty or you feel, you know, tired when you comb your hair? Or simply put it, if you squat for a while, do you have to use support to get up? So all these can give you clues towards any connective tissue or rather muscle weakness. Then further, you know, because we see do see a lot of Sjogren's syndrome. 
So again, typically any dryness in the eyes, dryness of the mouth, or you know, you can just ask for oral ulcers. Maybe a history of GRD is also you know very common, especially when we talk about systemic sclerosis and all these things. And finally, you know, try and elicit any history of Raynaud's phenomena. So these four five things, majorly, if you ask for, okay, you know that there may be something pointing towards a connective tissue disorder. Always, always try to include drug history, especially when you know you have a say, you know, NSIP pattern, and you're not able to find any other cause. Always try to elicit medication or drug history from the patients. So this becomes very important. And finally, you know, any other recent infections or something like that. This also becomes important. And finally, any medical history, say, uh, say family history. Because a lot of times what happens, okay, there, there may be history of connective tissue disorder in the family, but who may not have been diagnosed with ILD. And similarly, you have that. So again, eliciting this particular family history, drug history, medication history, connective tissue disorder history does play a very, very important role. Because do remember, idiopathic NSIP, again, very highly debatable. You should always, always, always try to look for a cause. Wonderful. So this was very, very interesting. You know, we were always taught that always ask from the head to toe. So you ask about history of hair fall, you ask about dryness of eyes, ask about redness of eyes, you ask about malar rash, you ask about the dry mouth, you ask about ulcers in the tongue if the patients are getting, you ask for joint stiffness in the arms, especially hands if it becomes worse, any rashes in the body. And then, of course, we ask about Raynaud's phenomenon. We ask about swallowing difficulty. Uh, we ask about joint pains, weakness, as so nicely said about Dr. Samir. Always ask drug history. Again, very, very important. And uh, HIV, if you're getting nothing, then get HIV done. Radiation sometimes can also present like this. So this is the history that you want to take in a patient of suspected NSIP over and above our routine respiratory history. Thank you so much, Samir, for this great answer. Now, I'd like to come to Dr. B.P. Singh. Uh, sir, thank you once again for the fantastic talk. It was really wonderful. So I'd like to ask you that uh, we have spoken about what history to take, what clinical findings. Now, after we know this patient is NSIP from the CT scan picture, what blood test would you like to send for this patient? Uh, sir, you're muted. Thank you. As already I have given this thing in my presentation that you have for the blood investigation, you require only the routine test. Apart from that, as already everybody has discussed this thing, then you have to rule out the CTD ILD. And for this, you need to have this uh, panel, the autoimmune investigation panel, where the, you have the uh, ANA, then ENA profile, just looking at the various anti autoantibodies and just to identify is there any flavor of any disease is there in the blood test or not. One thing which I mentioned actually KL6, actually Krebmond and Lung and uh, 6 level, that is important from the prognostic point of view where the disease activity you can monitor. And if the levels are high, then probably you are going to face with the deterioration in the clinical condition. All the discuss is not available uh, very easily and most of the places at my place it takes two weeks time and also a uh, lot of cost is there so probably that may not be there but routine test for ruling out the ctd ild you need to done uh, 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 do it very clear in most of the pay uh, almost every patient so this is one thing which is very important as a specific test for the nsib as far as the blood test is concerned Wonderful. I totally agree. So basically, all the connective tissue profiles that you might be having, we would like to do very mm -hmm. And normally, ANA blood will contain anti DS, DNA, and all the myositis, leroderma things. Over yes. and above, RA test, anti CCP usually is not a part of ANA profile, at least in Mumbai. So we basically end up yes. asking for it separately. So usually, RA test, ANA, anti CCP, ANCA. And the ANA profile. If all these come negative, then you might do the myo the myositis panel also because that might just be positive. And I feel basically maybe ESR, you know, just to follow the CTD. Yes. And we're going to start. CRB it's good to get the blood sugars, fasting, post lunch, HbA1c, and a baseline lipid profile. The usual test which we always do. So great. So this is very very important that uh, if history wise CTD is not fitting in, then please do the blood test. If anything comes positive. Please look for these conditions. It might just end up coming later. Thank you, sir, for the great answer. Uh, I'd like to come to Dr. Satish again now. So what are the two types of NSIPs? Uh, and uh, what do we find in both of them? Okay, uh, Amida, uh, thanks to 
Uh, the the invite i went to my pathologist i told her you know keep some slides <laughs> you know i want to revise and see what exactly just for my learning even though i may not be able to show those slides and then uh, what uh, uh, dr singh uh, showed uh, lovely pictures of uh, nsip the there are two types uh, basically and uh, it's combined now it used to be three uh one which is predominantly uh, in interstitial inflammation the second one first fibrosis and then the third one was mixed where you get the mixed pattern the fibrosis as well as uh, the inflammatory um so now we have two types uh, simplifying the uh, types uh, cellular variety and fibrosing variety <coughs> as the uh, the term itself says uh, in cellular Uh, there are a lot of uh, inflammatory cells uh, these inflammatory cells are in the interstitium like lymphocytes plasma cells and uh, um, and chronic other uh, inflammatory cells as in the indian fibrotic variety you see just fibrosis and there may be here and there uh, some uh, kind of uh, inflammatory uh, cells which are also seen in the mits of the fibrosis these are two varieties which are also mentioned radiologically by bowen they also mentioned about it and they also carry uh, good prognosis these are two varieties that uh, you know which are there in this what is important here is histologically when pathologists look into it and when we go and discuss what they are looking uh, for is the you know, homogeneity temporal homogeneity which bavin was also mentioning in his uh, in his radiological features and there is a diffuse alveolar wall thickening by uh, uniform um yeah uniformity and uh, there are no uh, foci of uh, granuloma there are no fibrotic there is no accentuation uh, which is uh, seen in uip so basically it has a very typical feature sometimes when you have a combined it's uh, the pathologist uh, said it's difficult to just by histology uh, differentiate yes this is nsip and this is not a probable uh, uip so uh, overall pattern suggests a temporal uh, homogeneity in this uh, amita that's what for a non pathologist i would sum up and say that this is what is the character cellular variety and fibrosing variety this was fantastic actually what you said right early light about was temporal homogeneity because that is a hallmark of nsip whether we see radiology whether we see pathology the homogeneity is something which is really striking and it differentiates it from uip because very often you know based on from where you've taken the biopsy you don't really know often what is going on and also the other thing that i really liked was the entire picture so it is always the mdd the clinical patho radiological entire picture that we want to see because otherwise we may not be able to know what we are dealing with so uh, cellular and fibrotic variety so if the patient has cellular and fibrotic both in one slide then we'll still call it fibrotic cellular has to be exclusively cellular like dr satish said and of course cellular variety will have excellent response to treatment but fibrotic also has a uh, good response as compared to uip thank you dr satish i really liked your answer and you know you went back to pathologists and i think it really helped so this <laughs> <laughs> Great. So after this, I'd like to come to Prajay. So you know we've been talking a lot about clinical stuff. So let's go to radiology, which is so exciting. So Dr. Prajay, please tell us what are the chest X-ray findings and HRCT findings, which are classical in NSIP. So as sir today went to the pathologist, I had to discuss with my radiology friends so that I should not miss out if there is some any questions are coming. so the hrcd findings what we get particularly in nsip is like you have is bilateral uh, you have ground glass in temporal homogeneity as you said in the same finding which you get in pathology also so not like heterogeneity as you see in uip pattern there is no apico basal gradient which is seen with uip honeycombing is normally not seen so that is the classical feature which you see with nsip that is honeycombing is not seen what you see is ground glassing intra interlobular septal thickening subpleural sparing can be seen and you have traction bronchiectasis this is most important features which are seen with your nsip if there is also associated connective tissue disease features you should also look for any as associated pleural effusions any mediastinal limb fadinopathies because that can give you a clinching diagnosis that you are dealing with some nsip with some because of some <laughs> connective tissue disease 
ोटोकॉल विच इज बीन carried out by dr bhavin jankaria sir which is very important not just getting a ct scan is important getting an hrct thorax with an ild protocol with a volume expanding images and prone images is very much important wonderful that was fantastic prajay i just like to add one or two things i mean you said everything that was complete just for our audience i just want to say about people might wonder what is homogeneity what is heterogeneity so i just want to make it really clear that when we say homogeneity that means both the lungs really look the same what is the involvement in the left lung will be exactly the involvement in the right lung unlike uh, uip patients where the two different lungs might look lung of two different patients so basically whenever we talk about nsip on ct scan the involvement in the lobes is like if the left lobe is showing something the right lobe will also right lower lobe will also show the same what left lower lobe is showing etc so basically this is a disease which is peripheral so basically the disease has peripheral predominance and the lower lobe involvement in fact the apicobasal gradient is there but what is really clinching is that if there is peripheral involvement then sometimes there might be just sub pleural sparing so disease is still peripheral but the sub pleural region might be just spared so this with apicobasal gradient and homogeneous looking thing will tell you that this is definitely nsip and as dr prajay very rightly said we see ground glass we see septal thickening we may see traction bronchiectasis but honeycombing is almost rare and i really liked uh, what dr prajay said about do media sternal cuts also and please look for associated findings pleural effusion lymph nodes look for esophageal dilatation this may just give you a hint so this is what uh, the ct scan looks like and x ray as he rightly said the usual reticular nodular opacities low lobe involvement more if progressed it might be everywhere but it just tells you there is an ild may not tell you this is nsip so thank you prajay i think meeting the radiologist helped and i think meeting radiologists pathologists i also met lot of people i did a lot of reading so i think these webinars in addition to teaching our delegates it's teaching us also so i think it's a wonderful initiative by the indian chair society so after prachay i'd like to now come to amina i want to say that uh, in a patient of suspected nsip history taken blood test done x ray done ct scan done what other investigations do you want to do for these patients not right counting the biopsy without the biopsy Okay, so I was actually going to discuss a couple of very interesting references that we got yeah, in the last one ahead, week. Yeah, then go ahead, but, please. But uh, before no, that, no, go ahead, go ahead. Patient... No, I mean, I mean, go ahead. It's absolutely fine. Okay. Okay. All right. So, right, ma'am. So, uh, coming to the blood test, I think a couple of things that I would like to point out, apart from the CT infections like PJP, HIV, and also the IgG four disease. which is also uh, associated with nsip coming back to my uh, references one was from the cardiology department that a person has been admitted with a congestive heart failure has uh, elevated nt pro bnp levels and now has developed ild now what i'd like to point out here is that chronic uh, congestion in the lungs or a chronic pulmonary edema can also present as septal thickening although the septal thickening in that case is a smooth uh septal thickening dr jankaria would be able to highlight that better i guess but uh, so so what i'm trying to highlight here is that this patient had all features of uh, an interstitial lung disease uh, almost fitting into the nsip pattern but in this case we chose uh, to tell them to decongest the patient first and then in a month's time repeat the ct scan and see that what we are calling as ild persists or not the second reference that we got about 5 days back was of a person with a male with ca breast who was on chemotherapy now admitted with 3 weeks history of uh, cough and breathlessness and again the ct scan picture was very classical of nsip now in this case we did decide to go ahead and do a tblc which is a transbronchial lung cryobiopsy and we ended up finding a lymphangitis carcinomatosis in this case so this is where the differentiation is and like we have been discussing earlier that you've got to look at the patient in a holistic manner 
so in the case uh, where uh, you have an existing malignancy and there is an interstitial uh, uh, pneumonia on the ct scan a biopsy becomes essential uh, if uh, i mean should i go on and tell about the bar no, i was actually also? wanting about uh, pulmonary fun i was thinking we'll talk about pft etc so if we talk of the pulmonary function test you would get a restrictive pattern in case of uh, nsip and uh, the uh, diffusion would be less uh, and uh, you can also do a functional assessment in the form of a 6 minutes walk test which uh, may or may not show uh, a reduction in the walk distance or desaturation in the initial stages of the disease but uh, this is the functional assessment that you would do in uh, patients in whom you are uh, i mean in whom you are diagnosing uh, ild nsip wonderful so basically the thing is that after history wise we suspect after we do the blood test chest x ray ct scan after that we basically want to do a complete pft and a 6 minute walk test for sure and as dr amina rightly said the fsc will be reduced the tls will be reduced and the diffusion yes. also will be reduced and the 6 minute walk test will so, uh, show desaturation of uh, more than 2% which is really important i would say over and above a 2d echo is very very important because uh, ctd is a possible underlying etiology and if we get pulmonary hypertension which is out of proportion to involvement of the lung by ct scan or if you get a diffusion which is out of proportionately reduced please do a 2d echo because sometimes patient could be having ctd related pulmonary hypertension in addition to having nsip and if it is ctd related pulmonary hypertension then over here you want to use medications to reduce pulmonary hypertension over and above using the nsip treatment and therefore i think 2d echo over here is extremely important and even if the patient has a report of 2d echo one year back but if your diffusion comes out of proportion as compared to what your ct scan is showing please repeat a 2d echo because if there is pulmonary hypertension related to ctd ild then treating it separately would definitely help us uh also i mean i really liked about the cases that you spoke about you know you got some flavor you know which is really very interesting uh so i want to basically again say one thing because hrct is my passion so uh we radiology we pulmonologists have to learn to read our ct scans correct because when we talk about pulmonary edema we know there's interstitial stage of pulmonary edema in that we would have septal thickening which would be smooth septal thickening but what is really important is that upper yeah. lobe vessels will be very very prominent so the vessels in the both upper lobes are so much more as compared to vessels across and often we see cardiomegaly we see pleural effusions which may tell us that maybe it's interstitial stage of pulmonary edema which is looking like nsip so uh, great i think this was good to get cases in wonderful uh i'm going to now come to samir uh, and uh, i'm going to ask him about the biopsy and amina you can always add on after that uh, because you were planning to talk about biopsy so samir how would you confirm diagnosis of nsip is lung biopsy required in every patient and if yes what type of biopsy would you advise you know i think this is a question which a lot of people would want to ask because nowadays you know the all intervention pulmonology seminars this that and you know cryo biopsies here and there so everyone does want to know that so one of the things is yes confirming diagnosis not just for nsip for any form of ild i would say the gold standard is a multidisciplinary discussion in fact all the latest papers be it cold eyes be it you know the recent uh, nejm paper also everyone compares their biopsy uh, yield to whatever has been found in md So I would say always get together. You know, if you're a hospital, if you're a busy practice, you have access to your radiologists. You know, you're friends with them. If not, make friends with them. You know, go to your pathologist, see those slides, get them together. Believe me, you know, the learning curve just goes up. You know, if you feel the case is very simple too, there would be something or the other which would always rattle you. So therefore, it's always important to have that MDD. Coming on to the brass tacks. Now is. uh of course method of confirming uh any sort of interstitial lung disease is a biopsy but is it required in any all the cases answer is no now it clearly says that yes first of all if you have a proper picture of nsip <laughs> on ct scan a nice high resolution ct scan your radiologist is used to reading it you know he or she has an experience of reading it always go back to the history elicit that history many a times it's or rather always do that uh, connected tissue disease profile and as dr uh, amita ma'am also mentioned if even if your you know initial ctd profile ana profile is negative ask for that myositis panel because the newer 16 antigen myositis panel and believe me when i tell you this you know most of the times when we have this ana profile negative almost 
you know, there is a chance that we do get myositis panel positive for this patient and on deeper history taking or rather, you know, getting them examined properly, there is invariably some or the other feature which, of course, the rheumatologist finds it. So, yes, in these patients, there is no need. Patients who have very clear-cut history of, say, a medication exposure, which forms a very, you know, causal temporal relationship with the appearance on the CT scan of an ILD picture, these are the cases in which, again, you do not really need to do a biopsy. So, eliciting that history it becomes very important. However, when you do not have any secondary cause, when you do not have any underlying CTD, or even if there are features, but the ANA profile, the extended profile is all negative, then definitely a biopsy is recommended. Now, of course, the gold standard for any sort of biopsy has been an open lung biopsy. But of late, recently, you know, with the cold ice paper, it sort of all changed because what they said, the concordance between your open lung biopsy and your cryo biopsy is close to 78%. And when they compare it to the MDD with the final diagnosis, you know, uh, there is hardly any statistically significant difference when you put, uh, pick up either an open lung biopsy or you do a cryo biopsy. So therefore, if you have to go for a biopsy and if you have the tools, if you have the expertise, please go for a uh, cryo biopsy. Now, why is this biopsy also important? There's a few reasons for that. Number one, the pattern of fibrosis, it may also mask the underlying ILD or rather, you know, there may be coexisting patterns as Dr. Jangaria was talking about. We, a lot of times we do see NSIP with OP pattern. Many times you also see HP. Now, it is a common, this thing to report in our center that, okay, underlying fibrotic HP, but what is the pattern of fibrosis? It could either be an UIP pattern of fibrosis or an NSIP pattern of fibrosis, which again becomes important. Sometimes there may not be a clear-cut diagnosis. As I said, okay, patient may have some feature of CTD, ANA profile all negative, and you do a biopsy. Sometimes, you know, you may find that occasional lymphoid follicle, which may say, okay, yes, this is indeed a CTD ILD, which may be seronegative at this point of time. And finally, you know, recent papers also talk about that patterns do evolve. Sometimes, you know, an indeterminate for UIP may uh, go on to a probable UIP, and that may go on to a definitive UIP. And therefore, as far as this is also concerned, Biopsy role becomes very important whenever you are, you know, you, you find an NSIB pattern, especially with a negative CTD profile, a negative history, no exposure history, nothing at all. You should definitely go for that biopsy. Important is the patient selection. It's not like, okay, I got a patient, I don't have anything, let's go for a biopsy. Look at that patient, look at, you know, the contraindications for your biopsy, your FEC value, your pulmonary hypertension, any other risk factors, obesity, type 2 failure which may actually do more harm than good because, you know, understand that cryobiopsies and all are better done through a rigid bronchoscopy conduit. So therefore, you know, all these factors do become important. So any patient with a negative history, uh, no exposures, nothing at all, do subject to biopsy if possible, but make sure you have the expertise for that. Select the right patient always. And finally, get all these cases irrespective of whatever you find to that MD. Wonderful. I think this was a fantastic uh, answer. And I just feel that over and above everything that Dr. Samir said uh, about the evolving pattern, sometimes we just can't tell on CT scan if it's fibrotic NSIP or if it's UIP. So that is one of the times when you may want to do a biopsy to confirm what is going on. But this was fantastic. No TBLBs. Do TBLC if possible. VATS, of course. But of course, TBLC gives us the answer and just because you know how to do it does not mean you do it you have to make sure your patient is also fit enough to uh, stand the procedure and only if it's going to help you like you have patient is hiv positive patient has ctd ild patient has exposure to drug and if the ct scan is showing the classical pattern of homogeneity both the lungs having symmetrical looking appearances lower low predominance peripheral with maybe subplural sparing then you need not do but if the cause is not known or if you want to differentiate between fibrotic ui uh, fibrotic nsip and uip then biopsy becomes important a uh, great summary this was a fantastic answer i'd like to come to dr bp singh you know whenever it's difficult case in treatment we always come to you so i want to start the treatment aspect with you so what is the first line of treatment of nsip please tell us about the doses and duration Actually, I have mentioned in this uh, presentation that the first line of treatment for the NSIP, if it is cellular NSIP, if it is basically the homogeneous appearance is there, not much of the fibrosis is there, you are starting with the steroid. The dose is prednisolone, uh, 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 the drug is prednisolone, 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg for 2 to 4 weeks. 
you should not ideally you should not taper it for four weeks just see the response if the response is there then start tapering it by decreasing the dose by 0.5 uh, to the ideal body weight 0.25 uh, mg of per, uh, per kg of the prednisolone for next month and see the response and depending upon the response you can taper it down 6 to 12 months and you have to continue till the disease is stabilized if the patient is not responding to the initial therapy then you may add other immunosuppressive agent like mycophenolate or azathioprine as a first choice although other drugs are also been mentioned but i have not um, experienced of using cyclophosphamide or even rituximab in our patient with an sip but the mycophenolate the dose is 1.5 gram bd or 1, 1 gram to 1.5 gram bd the maximum dose you have to start with 500 mg bd initially and you can escalate this treatment one to two weeks depending on the patient tolerance to the level of 2 to 3 gram per day or the mycophenolate azathioprine 0.5 to 2 mg uh, per kg of ideal body weight maximum is 200 mg uh, per day this azathioprine you can use it in again in the same pattern one to two weeks escalation time and extend this therapy for three to six months and see the response. If these patients are not doing well, then you can switch to the drug like rituximab, where you can use it this drug for one gram, two weeks interval, or one dose, then after six months repeat it. In, in the refractory patient, those who are not responding to the therapy. Those patients with fibrotic NSIP, you have to add antifibrotic there. And many in the many subgroup of patients, there is a mixed pattern where the fibrotic and cellular NSI both are there. Probably you need to have all the three drugs simultaneously in using it. But when there's advanced fibrotic disease is there, then you have to stop immune modulator. You have to use antifibrotic only. It may be an internalim or pefinidone. Okay, thank and you. And the so doses of the antifibrotics you all know. Yes. So uh, I would just like to add one thing. I mean, I completely agree with Dr. B.P. Singh. Basically, for steroid, uh, for NSIP, you want to use steroids if it's cellular variety. And uh, if underlying CTD is known, if the patient has scleroderma, then you may want to use steroids with mycophenolate. But steroids are the drugs of choice. And as he rightly said, the doses that we use are 0.5 to 1 mg per kg for two to four weeks. As he rightly said, I normally give it for four weeks. And after four weeks, I repeat a chest X-ray, complete PFT six minute walk test. And I usually reduce by 5 mg every two weeks. And I like to give 10 mg for about three months. That's what I do. So great. Uh, about antifibrotics, uh, I just want to clarify one thing, which uh, the thing is that just because the fibrotic NSIP is there, we will not upfront start antifibrotics. We will treat the patient yes. and on treatment, despite correct treatment, if the worst thing happens, two out of three, clinical, radiological or functional, if there's worst thing over next six months to 12 months, in two out of the three, then we will add antifibrotics. Right, sir? Yes. Yes. One thing much I want to add, Actually, in the acute exacerbation of NSIP LD, we use the loading dose of the methylprednisolone in the Wonderful. dose of 750 to 1 gram per day for three days and then de-escalate it. Wonderful, sir. Thank you so much. So now I'd like to come to Dr. Satish. Uh, do, uh, do Dr. B.P. Singh did touch upon it. Can you tell me which are the uh, steroid sparing drugs that you will, you know, with your vast experience and with your great knowledge, what are the steroid sparing drugs that you will recommend for NSIP? Okay. Uh, 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 Amit, I actually, I had earlier, uh, you know, I used to use a uh, lot of azothioprine. I was very comfortable and others were not really available. Even though cyclophosphamide has been there for long and uh, I haven't used much of cyclophosphamide. The rheumatologists have used cyclophosphamide. <laughs> and uh, I have uh, started using mycophenolate uh, for the last few years simply because very comfortable and also now uh, you know, it is recommended as a steroid sparing agent, also as a secondary treatment uh, of NSIP uh, along with uh, steroids. Uh, the other drugs which, uh, you know, was uh, mentioned, Rituxima, very rarely I've used Rituxima along with uh, rheumatologist's uh, help. Uh, cyclosporin, I have a couple of patients. That's because I'm surrounded by three rheumatologists, excellent rheumatologists in our uh, hospital. And uh, one of them was the uh, past, immediate past president of the Rheumatological Association of India, Dr. Dharmanan. So we get to see a lot and we get to learn each other from each other and also we we'll get to do a lot of MDD. So my choice of uh, using steroid sparing agent uh, along with uh, uh, steroids 
is generally mycophenolate. The others have been uh, there, but not, not many that I, I have found useful or very comfortable to use with them. Okay, wonderful. So that's great. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to come to Prajay. So Prajay, I want to ask you what is the, uh, actually we have about 40 more questions remaining from the audience. So quick answers. In addition to pharmacological treatment, what non-pharmacological treatment would you advise? So non-pharmacological treatment, not just for NSIB, it is for all fibrosing ILDs, I would say. The most important is the oxygen supplementation. If your saturation is below like 90 or 88 percent on room air, at rest, exertion or sleep, because that is a level A evidence. Second is a pulmonary rehab, which is most important. That is also level A evidence. Vaccination with the flu and Prevnar and Pneumovax 23 vaccine and treatment of underlying GRD, because that is the most important, because that can lead to your progressing of further the whatever underlying fibrosis, which is there. So these are the certain non-pharmacological treatments, which are very important and symptomatic treatment for your cough and dyspnea. And also associated complications. You also have to need to treat obstructive sleep apnea if a patient has along with interstitial lung disease because it can also further cause decrease in the oxygen and can lead to more pulmonary hypertension. Wonderful. Uh, so I really like this about the sleep apnea that you spoke about because we know that obstructive sleep apnea is a known comorbidity for patients of interstitial lung disease. And without they being obese, without they having snoring, they actually could be having underlying sleep apnea because of the change lung mechanics because of the ILD and treating them with the CPAP if they have OSA would actually reduce the pulmonary hypertension and would actually add so many more years to their life and would actually also improve the quality of their life. So uh, wonderful. Uh, this is not something that is recommended yet. We are going to work on this. The ICS is going to soon come up with the guidelines. But if your patient is more than 50 years of age and is going to get steroids, then I'm going to recommend steroids, any immunosuppression, then over and above the flu and the pneumonia vaccines. In today's day and age, we'll also uh, suggest the herpes vaccine. So though it is not in the guidelines, in Indian guidelines, but this is something that uh, we are giving now because uh, herpes could be really very, very incapacitating and depressing. So wonderful. And of course, if nothing works, then lung transplantation. Yes. So that always remains. Great. Uh, Prachay, thank you so much for this answer. Uh, now coming to you, Amina. So Amina, what is the prognosis of NSIP? What would you like to tell us in general about NSIP patients prognosis? Right. Right, ma'am. So generally, the survival of NSIP patients is better than that of IPF. Many studies have reported a five-year survival of more than 70%, particularly in the cellular NSIP where there is more inflammatory component that can be controlled with the medication. Also, we have noticed that the survival is better for CTD-related NSIP as compared to idiopathic NSIP. However, the recurrences and the flares are common. And uh, we should also remember that with every exacerbation, the lung function further deteriorates and it makes the patient more prone to developing further exacerbations. Uh, also, an interesting finding is that an overall clinical diagnosis of chronic HP was found to be an independent predictor of mortality as well. So uh, to sum it up, basically NSIP has a better survival than IPF. If you have a CTD-related ILD, better survival as compared to an idiopathic NSIP. And with every exacerbation, the lung function is bound to go down. Wonderful. So NSIP actually has good prognosis. And therefore, please don't write off your NSIP patients like you may want to write off your UIP patients. And most importantly, NSIP patients do well. Please learn to read your CT scans because here you're going to be using steroids. Unlike UIP, where we're only giving them antifibrotics. So as Dr. Amina rightly said, Good prognosis, please avoid exacerbations because with, uh, if, sorry, please avoid infection because with every infection, there could be an exacerbation and therefore the role of vaccines comes in. So great. So I think we've had a superb discussion on NSIP. Just a few questions on, uh, on organizing pneumonia and then let's just start taking our audience questions. So um, Asabir, I'd like to come to you. So what is organizing pneumonia and what is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia? Quick answers. Okay. So anyways, I won't dwell on it much since Dr. Singh has already covered this part. So in general, you know, organizing pneumonia, you can just simply remember, okay, there is a persistent inflammation, which is there in the lung parenchyma somewhere. Now, majorly organizing pneumonia, it's a histological diagnosis, which, uh, you know, everyone, I mean, since we have been discussing, it's majorly that, uh, you know, granulation tissue, which is connected, which is uh, nothing but some connective tissue, uh, which are formed there in the distal alveolar lumen or sometimes can be seen in the bronchial lumen. Characteristically, this is called uh, Mason's body. 
So now this organizing pneumonia, it's as I said, it this is just a histological pattern. Now, what is the exact cause? That depends on the clinical context. Now, this could be secondary to some say determined causes, which is called OP of determined causes, which most common cause by far is the infections. And a recent paper also suggested that viral infections are the most common cause for it. Further, you know, any other bacterial infection, even tuberculosis, can also cause organizing pneumonia patterns. Certain drugs. Uh, are there like nitrofurantoin very commonly not very commonly but yes most common pattern of uh, ild which nitrofurantoin can cause is again op pattern uh, even lung transplants bone marrow transplant these all can cause op so this is basically you know what is op op is a pattern which can be uh, secondary to any particular cause now when you rule out anything and everything that is your connective tissue disorders your say infections your drugs and still you are left with this particular thing that is something which is called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, wherein you do not really have a cause. And this also used to be called BOOP or bronchiolitis obliterans uh, organizing uh, pneumonia pattern, where there is no discernible cause after a complete workup. So this is the basic difference between OP and CO. Okay, great. So I really like what you said that organizing pneumonia is something which affects the interstitium and the alveoli. And where there's no underlying cause for it, we call it cryptogenic. Uh, you did mention a few of the causes, but I'd go to Dr. B.P. Singh to know more causes. So which are the common conditions which are associated with organizing pneumonia? As Dr. Bansala already mentioned, most of them, the most important thing apart from this, basically, as he has mentioned, the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, which is very rather rare disease, less than 3% patients, they are diagnosed with the COP. Otherwise, most of them, Plus, secondary organizing pneumonia. And the most important, apart from the infection, is the connective tissue disease, especially. And many, especially the dermatomyositis, the basically the other group of the diseases, and other the Sjogren's syndrome, the SLE, the uh, basically uh, the rheumatoid arthritis, they all can cause organizing pneumonia. Studies have shown very clearly. In, in the infections, as the viral infections, he has mentioned that COVID-19 has been one of the important cause, apart from the SARS-CoV-1 and 2, and also the influenza uh, is also reported to cause this type of uh, organizing pneumonia. However, the bacterial infection, especially the chlamydia, rickettsia, mm -hmm. mycoplasma, even streptococcus pneumonia is reported to cause organizing pneumonia. And also, as he has already mentioned, the transplants, especially the lung transplant, the liver transplant, and the bone marrow transplant, they all have been attributed to cause this organizing pneumonia. And apart from this, there's especially the radiotherapy causing organizing pneumonia, especially after the CA breast, it is known to occur. So there are uh, many more causes. and a long list of drugs are there as you can you have antibiotics like nitrofurantine you can have anti-cancer drugs like bleomycin the uh, myelon and uh, sulfon and other newer uh, monoclonal antibody the uh, lot many immunotherapy are responsible for causing this organizing pneumonia so a huge list is there to identify the secondary organizing pneumonia Wonderful. So, you know, as Dr. B.P. Singh and Dr. Samir told us that there are many, many causes and just like uh, idiopathic NSIP, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia is very, very uncommon. So whenever you have the organizing pneumonia pattern, please find out the underlying cause. And what is important is infections. So infection <coughs> also give rise to organizing pneumonia. And it is very, very important to understand when the infective stage is over and when is it gone into organizing state, because that is a time when you may have to start steroids, which you may not have wanted to start it in the earlier phase. So very, very important, very, very interesting. Thank you so much, Dr. B.P. Singh and Samir for giving a complete answer. After this, I'd like to come to uh, Prajay. So uh, uh, actually, just uh, one second. I order. Yeah, Prajay only. Correct, correct, right. Okay, fine. So, uh, Prajay, I'd like to ask you, uh, what are the X-ray and HRCT findings in organizing pneumonia? Um, as we have already discussed before, the HRCT findings would be for organizing pneumonia is bilateral, symmetrical. You have a consolidation patches with central ground glassing. This is very important. Uh, and they can sometimes be have fleeting opacities. It may, they, it may re spontaneously resolve on its own and they may reappear, reappear after two weeks. So this is the classical feature which is seen on the CD scan, which is also called as the reverse halo sign, which initially used to be the classical sign for organizing pneumonia, but now it is also being seen with invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. 
along with subdural as jangaria sir said it can be seen with peribronchovascular in location along with that if you have some other non specific features like some nodules or some other some other uh, little solid opacities then you should try to do a biopsy for that because sometimes lymphomas or malignancies can present as an organizing pneumonia on chest x ray you would normally see a bilateral uh, consolidation patches which are normally peripheral in location morely in the mid zone and the lower zone okay great so we see either subpleural or peribronchovascular we see ground glass we see consolidations reverse halo sign also called a toll sign yeah. wonderful that was a beautiful point and fleeting opacities so wonderful i actually thought i was missing something i forgot the clinical features so coming to the boss dr satish what are the clinical features of organizing pneumonia symptoms and examination findings okay uh, uh, amita these okay. patients typically present with uh, subacute uh, onset of uh, respiratory symptoms mainly in terms of uh, non productive cough they just have cough which doesn't go away and they come and tell us that i have used multiple antibiotic i have gone to multiple doctors but not better my cough is not going troubling me so much and then breathlessness you know which is also another respiratory symptom that we all come across in most uh, form of uh, diseases and uh, the other symptom is fever in spite of antibiotic in spite of taking medication that my fever just doesn't go i have used all kinds of antibiotic to, you know that's another symptom and then feeling very tired weak malaise uh, night sweat sometimes and losing weight these are some of the symptoms and if you go back and since we have an ongoing flu season which is going on for uh, months together now because i i keep seeing a lot of these patients who come with you know not better one month over six months over and then when you uh, when you image them and do other tests you will definitely find out so if you are not responding to antibiotics it's not an infective and uh, it is inflammatory and as you rightly said you know when does this infection end and when does the inflammatory begins that's where i think you the one of the thing that i have found useful is the crp so when an elevated crp and patients very sick use multiple antibiotic definitely it has to be cryptogenic it has to be organizing pneumonia that's how you diagnose and then weight loss malaise not feeling great not feeling well lack of appetite all these are symptoms which will point out towards that we are dealing with something like an organizing pneumonia not a bacterial pneumonia and and you may you know you may get some organism sometimes but uh, they, they may be coincidental wonderful and on examination we'll get the by basal fine crepitations the yes. type of crepitations right wonderful thank you so this is very important in addition to breathlessness and cough we get so many other systemic symptoms which may want us to feel about tb etc but uh, fever not responding to antibiotics is really a very very important symptom which we cannot really ignore Uh, so patients only present with fever and nothing else so great dr satish you know this is where your experience comes in thank you so much now coming to amina amina a big question for you so you are suspecting organizing pneumonia x ray ct scan is done clinical examination is done so what all tests would you want to do for this patient so uh, before labeling it as a cryptogenic organizing pneumonia one would always want to rule out a secondary cause Uh, uh before that of course as dr satish uh, rightly pointed out uh, an elevated crp level would be very very helpful in pointing towards the diagnosis uh, uh other than that we would rule out autoimmune causes we do an ana profile rheumatoid factor ccp it's very commonly seen with rheumatoid arthritis uh, the organizing pneumonia picture and would also want to do a cpk uh, to rule out polymyositis dermatomyositis scl70 and extended myositis panel as we've been discussing also an anti mda5 for anti synthetase uh, syndrome when we do a pulmonary function test we can find a restrictive ventilatory defect or even preserved lung volumes in the initial mild uh, disease in terms of uh, gas exchange abnormalities arresting or exercise hypoxemia would be noted uh, on an abg you would find an alveolar arterial oxygen gradient of more than 20 in almost more than 80% of the cases with the uh, op now coming to invasive testing so that is usually required when you have to rule out an infection hemorrhage eosinophilic pneumonia or a lymphangiectic malignancy 
In the bowel, you would find a mixed picture of lymphos of about 20 to 40 percent, along with some eosinophils about 5 to 25 percent. There would be foamy macrophages, mast cells, and plasma cells. But the big question here again is when to biopsy. So if you've already found a cause, if you have a CTD that links uh, with your uh, clinical radiological picture, or if you have a known preceding infection like an influenza or a pseudomonas or an atypical pneumonia that is likely to cause OP, then we can avoid biopsy. But in a non-resolving pneumonia where you do not have an etiological diagnosis, in a negative autoimmune profile, all causes of OP of a secondary organizing pneumonia excluded, then it becomes necessary to do a biopsy, either a surgical lung biopsy or now a TBLC or even a CT guided biopsy. Wonderful. So I completely agree. Uh, I just feel that uh, it is very, very, and when you're doing a biopsy, do a bowel and just rule out other infections also. And uh, in uh, organizing pneumonia, in fact, TBLB also, if your TBLB uh, sizes will be big, then in addition to TBLC, you can also think of doing TBLB for diagnosing organizing pneumonia. And uh, I feel that what we need to remember is that ESR is always very, very high in these patients. And usually WBC count is also high. So that's the reason why we feel probably this is infection because there is fever with high count and high CRP and high ESR. So if you're not sure whether this is fever or organizing pneumonia, at this stage, I would definitely recommend that we intervene. And as Dr. Amina rightly said, uh, you know, we could do a bronchoscopy so that you can do bowel at the same time because multiple areas are involved. And then from the area which is most commonly affected, there you can do biopsies from, prove it's organizing pneumonia, rule out infection, and then treat the patient. And of course, as Dr. Amina said, if the patient has history of taking some medicine, if the patient is a known case of CTD, ILD, then the patient uh, pattern is very, very typical, then you need not do a biopsy. And of course, the uh, complete PFT is required, six-minute work test, ABG, etc., everything that she said, and the blood test. So thank you so much, Amina, for this fantastic answer. Now I'd like to come to Samir. So Samir, can you please tell us how would you treat organizing pneumonia, doses, and duration? You're muted. Yeah, sorry. So I think, again, this is one of the most... Uh, uh, you can say, you know, something shades of gray sort of a topic because the duration of the treatment is something that, you know, nobody is very clear upon. Now, when it comes to the underlying cause or a secondary OP, the major, major thing is, okay, you treat the secondary cause, say an infection. Along with that, you put steroids. Or when it is COP, that is where the major challenge lies. That, okay, you treat with steroids, but how much steroids? Now, usually most of the guidelines, what they say, now I'll come to the British Thoracic Guide, uh, Society guidelines, which actually recommends 0.75 mg to 1 mg per kg per day. And you wean it off over a period of 6 to 12 months. Whereas, you know, the recent NEJM paper, which uh, Dr. Singh also showed, so that mentions 0.5 to 0.75 mg per kg. So again, as per most of these guidelines, you know, Dr. Ganesh Raghu also spoke recently about, you know, and he summarized about cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And in fact, Frontiers also recently, last year, I think April, they had published this update on OP and COP. So typically what they say, you start it anywhere between 0.5 to 1 mg per kg in a tapering manner. And usually this can be anywhere from three months to one year. Now, this is again, not a very guideline, societal guideline recommendation. It is just that you have to see. Now, typically what happens is that once you start reducing the steroids, now what they say, whenever you start it, the initial dose you should maintain for about six to eight weeks, and then you should start tapering. Uh, but watch for the relapse. Now, usually the relapse rate is also as high as 50% in cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And this typically happens when you are up at about 10 milligrams equivalent, you know, prednisolone dose per day. So that is how you have to tailor the therapy. Okay, if the patient is having this sort of a reaction or rather a relapse, maybe you can go on to some other regimen. Now, if Basically, there is persistent disease or gradual worsening, despite being on, say, 0.5 mg per kg per day of prednisolone. Then they sometimes recommend going higher, say, 0.75 to 1 mg per kg for 4 to 8 weeks, and then you reduce it and taper slowly. If a patient does not respond to a glucocorticoid or you cannot taper the glucocorticoid, that is when you start thinking about alternative therapies or steroid sparing agents which I think everyone has summarized so far, which would be cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, or even mycophenolate. A recent paper mentions about OP in CTD, role of mycophenolate. And finally, the fulminant disease. That is where the role of uh, pulse uh, doses comes in. 
and in fact the recent updates have also uh, said although this has been tested for a long long time that you know low dose macrolides can also be given for the therapy especially when it is just a very mild to moderate form of a disease that is when you can treat with this also so these are few you know uh, bits and pieces about treatment again no societal guidelines which say no this has to be mandated or so on so forth is basically you start with a particular therapy particular dose maintain it for 6 to 8 weeks then taper over a course of 6 to 12 months and keep watching for those relapses and see whenever possible use uh, you know move on to steroid sparing it uh wonderful so basically the thing is that i completely agree with dr samir said i uh, just want to add on uh, that the thing is that uh, if the patient has uh, post infective then usually treating for 2 uh, to 3 months is usually enough and post infective organizing pneumonia don't relapse that often so that was one thing and if it's drug induced then again giving shorter duration of treatment of steroids is okay however if it's related to uh, ctd or ld then usually we end up giving for about 9 months to 12 months otherwise the relapses are quite common and i really liked what uh, dr uh, samir said about relapses because the thing is that yeah. relapses are known so don't be in a rush to reduce steroids because then you may have to start with a higher dose of steroids and therefore in the bargain the patient might end up getting cumulatively higher dose so organizing pneumonia excellent response however relapses are frequent and therefore please know what is the cause of your op and then treat accordingly and please go systematically and slowly before tapering of the steroids so coming to dr bp singh two questions for you first is how is the prognosis of op and how would we prevent relapses and how would we treat relapses are you muted uh, already you have mentioned the prognosis of the op is very good even the for the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia mortality is very rare, uh, uh, rare and most of these patients they recover and with the steroid yes you have mentioned that once you are start tapering the relapses are quite common especially with the patients of cop and almost to the tune of 50% in the secondary even their uh, or secondary organizing pneumonia there also relapses are quite common once you reduce the dose of dr mansal already mentioned up to level of 10 mg of prednisolone per day but the best thing is that even with the relapses the organizing pneumonia mortality is not increased so we, you treat it with the lower doses of steroid with a 20 mg of prednisolone per day till the disease is controlled and just taper it down slowly or you can add other drug as a immune modulator just to have much more efficacious uh, effect so in that way the response is good you can continue and you treat the steroid uh, relapse with the steroid with the lower dose and continue it for some time till the disease is controlled wonderful so this was uh, fantastic so the thing is that op has good uh, response to treatment it has good prognosis and therefore please treat with the correct doses till the disease is inactive uh, and then you taper slowly as dr bp singh said so this was very very interesting whether you give high doses for a shorter period or a less dose for a longer period it is important to taper slowly so that is great we have just too many questions from the audience uh, we have i think about 16 88 people still logged in so i'll quickly take some questions or uh, just a request just try to give one line answers if possible so we have a very very interesting question from uh, dr dinesh from uh, rajasthan uh, bilwara he is asking let me give this question to samir because it's about biopsy so samir in your clinical practice what percentage of nsip stroke op patients are subjected to biopsy whether bronchoscopic ct guided or whatever type of biopsy so in fact we were reviewing our data so of all the 350 biopsies that we have done hardly anyone is nsip and that's the most of the common cause for that is because you know if you dig into history you do an ana profile or something something or the other does come positive so he's asking still, in what percentage of yeah so but still whatever we find i would say about 10 to 15% of all nsip patients on nsip pattern on ct scan we subject them to biopsy ultimately Okay, and OP any idea offhand? OP not really. Yes, uh, when we see a non-resolving consolidation, at that point of time we subject them, and this is again we do a regular transbronchial lung biopsy, and we are able to find an answer. Okay, this is an organizing pneumonia, and invariably BAL also tells us okay this is secondary to this infection, Klebsiella or whatever, and we treat that. So again, I can't really put a number to that. Okay. Uh, but yes, off late we have been seeing a lot many lot more OPs. I would say. 
Okay, great. So I just feel that you have to suspect conditions, but most importantly, please learn to read your CT scan. There's just, I think that is the best, you know. Uh, there's a very interesting question uh, from Dr. Disha from Pune. Uh, she's asking, can lung oscillometry pick up NSIP? Any literature available? Who would like to take this question? What is the question? Uh, can iOS, can oscillometry pick up NSIP. So we can maybe make this into can NSI, can oscillometry pick up ILD to make it easier mm -hmm. and any literature available? I think one paper is there, although I have not gone through that. One paper is there on looking at the uh, impulse oscillometry in the patient of the interstitial lung disease. And But unfortunately, I have not gone through the whole literature, so I will not be able to answer it. But definitely there is paper. Yeah, so I would like to basically say that, you know, we can look at the area under curve when it's becoming smaller. Mm -hmm. We would know that there is restriction. And I think it's a very, very interesting question by Dr. Disha. And, uh, Dr. Disha, I'm requesting that a few weeks back, we did a webinar on impulse oscillometry where we had Dr. Sandeep Salvi actually talking about how to diagnose ILD on iOS. So maybe you can refer to the webinar. Yeah, and if you want, uh, we've actually emailed it to all the ICS members, but if you want, you can message me. I'll send you the link because uh, in addition to the area under the curve, there are many other points that he spoke about, which I don't often remember, which might tell. But impulse oscillometry is actually capable of diagnosing restriction, which is very, very yes. important. So I think iOS is something which is fantastic, you know, which we all need to use more. We have uh, our doctor, uh, Anike from Maharashtra Pune. He's asking that um, our steroids, uh, so uh, I'll ask this question to Dr. Satish. Are steroids recommended for every case of NSIP, even if it is fibrotic? Good question, uh, Amita. I think uh, he's good keeping, question. fantastic question. So he's keeping in mind about you know uh, two types of uh, NSIP that we spoke: the fibrotic variety and the cellular variety. I think that's that's where the problem is. In fibrotic, you know, maybe may not be helpful, and in cellular, it helpful. To come to the point. Actually, in all NSIP, you start with the steroid, except very mild uh, cases where you don't want to do anything and just keep them under observation. But otherwise, cellular variety, fibrosing variety, start steroids because we said the prognosis is good, the, uh, the response is also good, barring few patients where you have to use immunosuppression and other steroid sparing agents. I think in all varieties, you must use steroids. Wonderful. So, Dr. Satish, I completely agree with you. So, Dr. Aniket, fantastic question. If it is NSIP, if you're sure, however fibrotic it is, you have to use steroids. And that is why diagnosing NSIP is so important because yeah. we can do so much for NSIP. Prognosis is so much better. Pival survival rate is so much higher. And by using steroids, you'll actually, if at all, postpone the period of lung transplant. So, I think it is a, a fantastic question and a great answer. I'd like to come to uh, Amina. Amina, please answer this question. Dr. Surinder Kumar from Haryana Panchkula is asking, macrolide for three-month biopsy-proven cases of NSIP. So, you know, uh, Dr. B.P. Singh had spoken about in NSIP, one of the treatment is three months of macrolides. So, he's asking that... For COP. OP. So, for OP, he yeah. said that three months of... Uh, yeah, so there's a... So, for three months of uh, macrolides for organizing pneumonia, is it only for biopsy-proven or even if you're suspecting, can you use? Well, uh, uh, in my opinion, I feel it would be an overkill if you uh, just uh, without a proven diagnosis of organizing pneumonia, subject somebody to three months of macrolide treatment. Uh, see, if you are suspecting OP and uh, treating, I guess it's better to begin with the uh, steroid and see the response. Usually OP responds very well to uh, steroids and uh, trying out macrolides and correct me if I'm wrong, trying out macrolides without a proven biopsy uh, might not be the best idea. I completely agree with you, Amina. Very well said. First of all, if you want to do macrolides, then please confirm it is uh, OP. And at the okay. same time, when we know that uh, steroids is going to respond very beautifully too, and now we know how to manage side effects of steroids. So I would definitely, and we are looking at a limit period. It's not that lifelong steroids. So I would definitely give right. steroids uh, for this patient. Um, come on, uh, Prajay, coming to you, a very good question from Dr. Nilesh Pandare Maharashtra, uh, Akola. He's saying that perfenidone benefits or indications over nintenidib. So if at all it's a NSIP which is progressing, if it's PPF NSIP, then when would you prefer perfenidone 
over an intended rib? I think a very good question. So as of now, most of the trials as well as the inbuilt trial, they clearly say that the nintenanib is uh, much more superior than perfenodon as a, for a fibrotic NSIB variety when it is progressing. Uh, the only indications becomes when you cannot use nintenanib because of its probably side effects like loose motions or intolerance, then you should try to shift to perfenodon. Because most of the studies have shown there is a clear-cut benefit with nintadanib and has shown to a significantly declines the FVC uh, as compared to the placebo. Okay, uh, I agree. So, uh, basically the thing is that as per the study that we have, the study was only done on nintadanib. So, it wasn't actually a comparative study. So, the thing is that in the uh, study, nintadanib was used and it was found to be useful you know in patients it reduced the lung function deterioration etc perfenidone basically because we don't have robust data according to me perfenidone is equally good so for some reason if your patient cannot use the intended the patient keeps on getting too much of diarrhea or the patient keeps on getting hepatitis with the intended which is not getting really corrected then definitely we can use perfenidone yeah. but till we get robust data uh, for progressive primary fibrosis uh, we will have to say intended to be used first before starting perfenidon, unlike UIP, where we can use either of the two. So thank you, uh, Prajay, for this answer. Great. And personally, I have also used perfenidon in some of my patients where nintadanib is not tolerating and they have given good results. Wonderful. Uh, you know, this is a very, very good question from Dr. Venu Gopal from Tamil Nadu, Chennai. Um, Dr. B.P. Singh, you can take this. He's saying that, yes. you know, everybody always keeps on mentioning about the ILD registry of India. So, is there any follow-up of these patients that how many, in how many percentage of patients the diagnosis actually changed? I think this is a fantastic question. Actually, uh, uh, many times you start with the uh, treatment of these patients and once you follow them, as you have already, we have been discussing this thing, that in the patients the NSIP, it may change even with the patient of the OP. Initially, you may not get in the uh, connective tissue flavor in any of these patients and later on they develop the disease. So diagnosis may change. How are changing a pattern of HP and uh, uh, fibrotic NSIP has been quite common. And sometimes it is very difficult to identify the UIP also in uh, patient uh, differentiating from the chronic HP or fibrotic NSIP. Although classically it is said uh, basically the subpleural sparing is there in NSIP, in 20% of the patient it is there, not in every patient. So you, there are a lot of confusion and many times it is the biopsy which tells you it is the confirmed diagnosis or other collaborative features which develop later on. So, yes. But precisely to say the exact number, I don't think well, I'm in position. Uh, so I would like to point out one thing. I completely agree with Dr. B.P. Singh and Dr. Venu Kupal. Thank you so much for asking this question. But I personally feel as if the Indian ILD registry, unfortunately, very small number was actually biopsy proven. And That's most very small. reported by uh, two different radiologists. So basically, we really don't know uh, how much was like if the number would have changed had the biopsy been done. But because two separate blindfolded radiologists had actually reported Therefore, this is what it is. But uh, And these were actually patients who were already following up with the concerned department for a long period of time. It wasn't that they were basically picked up. So I feel the diagnosis probably would not have changed. But I think it would be very, very interesting. Thank you so much for the suggestion that we actually follow up these patients and see what happens. You know, there are just so many wonderful questions. I'm just quickly taking a few. Uh, I think I'll ask this to us. Uh, Samir, uh, Samir, uh, Dr. Dinesh uh, Rajasthan Balwara, again, he's asking, does myositis profile results help us in terms of any change in the treatment option? Wonderful question. What do you want to say? Uh, I'm so sorry, ma'am. I did not get the question. There was some, you know, negative okay. issue or uh, something. Basically, you know, we all kept on saying, right, that if the ANA panel comes negative, please do a myositis panel. We kept on insisting. So he's asking that if the ANA panel is negative and if the myositis panel comes positive, then will it change your treatment by any chance? So it does change the treatment. In fact, uh, one of the major or rather mainstays for this is, say, for example, you get an idiopathic NSIP or, or, or for that matter, any pattern of ILD. And you're trying to find that, okay, any underlying cause because the treatment does change quite a bit. For example, I have an ANA profile which is completely negative. And I would think, okay, this person may be qualified only to receive, say, for example, some antifibrotic therapy because I'm seeing... Okay, uh, there is progressive fibrosis or rather this could just be a fibrotic NSIP or maybe there is a probable UIP or something like that. 
however if you dig and you find that yes there is a female and or or rather you know a middle aged female and then you do a myositis panel it can completely change the dynamics of the treatment because these patients can then be subjected to some immunomodulator therapy and all and that is the basis that why you should dig into this particular thing especially if you get a pattern which is suggested that there could be a secondary cause to this rather than you know being just a ipf or something Wonderful. So this is very, very important. You know, uh, myositis panel coming positive may not decide if you're going to use steroids over which uh, steroids pair up. But the thing is that the label of UIP might change actually to a secondary UIP. You know, so basically it doesn't remain IPF at all. And therefore giving treatment is actually providing them a new lease of life. So definitely in today's day and age, if any profile comes negative, please do a myositis panel because you will end up offering treatment which you otherwise might not end up Uh, offering to the patient we have dr anupama from tamil nadu she is asking from coimbatore she is asking uh, okay so i think uh, dr satish uh, i'll ask this question to you that if the patient has biopsy proven nsip which is progressive pulmonary fibrosis you know over time that you have seen then what treatment would you offer to this patient okay i think the term itself says that it's progressive so when there is a progressive there is a role for anti fibrotic and you have used corticosteroids immunosuppression and there is progression so then you have to use the uh, the anti fibrotic like nitrinidin versus perfinidin we already spoke i i would use in it is a progression of fibrosing ild fibrosing and sip and anti fibrotic is added to this patient yeah so wonderful so if you know it is nsip and if you uh, show despite treatment that it is progressive then anti fibrotics will be added and you will use nitrinidin first as dr satish rightly said thank you so much uh, amina are you there okay i think uh, okay i'll just uh, give this question to whose turn is it i'm lost dr bp singh um dr yeah. sunil karoka from punjab uh, he's asking very interesting question uh, what about uh, Uh, corticosteroids in diabetic patients we used uh, steroids in diabetic patient keeping the diabetes under control with the help of the endocrinologist and whenever it is indicated we are using uh, the minimum effective dose that is what we want to say the minimum effective dose for the sufficient period of time to see the response and taper it down as soon as it is possible to the minimum dose um, yeah. it, we take the help of the endocrinologist But we are wonderful, using. wonderful. So, presence of diabetes is not a contraindication, especially NSIP OP. We are actually talking about good steroid responsive conditions. So, please involve an endocrinologist, and therefore, definitely treat your uh, patients with steroids. And if at all, if you still just can't manage, then you may come with steroid sparer drugs. But otherwise, please use. You know, presence of yeah. diabetes is is never a contraindication to using steroids. Um, Amina, are you there, Amina? So uh, okay, while I think because she is just uh, she got little locked out by mistake. Uh, Amina, are you there? Can I ask you a question? Okay, so I'll just quickly just ask her two questions uh, till she comes because more and more questions are coming. I'm getting little stressed now. So uh, let me ask uh, Samir. So Samir, there's a question about can you get organizing pneumonia in a patient of malignant melanoma, and how will you treat this patient? Okay, uh, so Dr. Shriyami Saha from Kolkata has asked this question. Okay, now uh, frankly, I think we'll have to go through the literature to find out whether malignant melanoma per se can cause OP. I am not very sure. The only malignant melanoma patients we have seen are with metastasis to lung parenchyma so far. Uh, but again, uh, in general, you know, uh, if if because there are certain malignancies, especially in lymphomas and all, which can definitely cause organizing pneumonia pattern in the lung itself. again major important thing over here is to biopsy prove what exactly is it is it a melanoma which is really causing this metastasis or is it you know just an organizing pneumonia if at all melano uh, melanoma is causing and the treatment for that would generally be any underlying cause treatment in this case of course it would be treatment if melanoma is actually causing it but steroids additionally would really help out so again very sorry i don't really know whether melanoma per se can cause an op pattern or Uh, yes, I think very interesting question. But I believe any kind of malignancy probably could cause. So, but just make sure if you're giving any particular chemotherapy, it should not be drug induced. Uh, yes, because or yeah, uh, Amina, are you there? Otherwise, I think we'll just wind it up. I think Amina is trying to log in. She's not able to. Uh, this is a wonderful. Uh, 
uh, there's a wonderful comment from my very 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 dear friend dr tarik mahmud he's saying that a fantastic ild webinar after a very very long time i've really enjoyed listening to something a big big thank you to every speaker and every faculty so thank you dr tarik for this wonderful comment dr tridip chatterji a favorite person from maharashtra a dear pathologist who listens to all the webinars is always encouraging us he has said is there any recording available because i missed a part of it so yes dr tridip there is recording and we will uh, send it to you there are very many many questions from dr sanket dr rida dr bhaveja dr vishal dr shehbaz they all have been asking questions that have got covered like uh, when to uh, use anti fibrotics then the questions have been how to prevent relapses how to treat relapses of organizing pneumonia so all these have been discussed so thank you so much for putting in so many questions but i think we will send the recording to everybody so that they can listen because it's already 10:45 pm and i think we should uh, now stop the webinar so a huge big thank you to dr bp singh Dr. Satish, Dr. Prajay, Dr. Amina, and Dr. Samir Vansal and Dr. Bhavin for this fantastic webinar. The information that you all have given us is absolutely golden. It is state of the art. It's going to help us so much become better pathologists. And our patients are lucky that we will subsequently treat them after learning so many things from you. A huge big thank you to Indian Chest Society for the wonderful initiative of percolating knowledge everywhere. a huge big thank you to team sipla especially harshal and our technical team prachi for uh, making sure that uh, we could have this webinar really without any kind of uh, break up or anything and uh, we have a great login and a huge big thank you to our audience 1688 logins even now which is a great great response so with this uh, thank you so much thank you very much ma'am thank you ma'am